Nobody ever talks about the fact that, you know, matrix in Latin means womb, right? And that's all it was, it was the womb. But if you're able to see that the whole universe around you is God, and you think you're the only exception to that, mm. that's ego. Because no matter how vast technology becomes, it does not represent the evolution of man. It represents the evolution of external realities, but man is his internal reality. To see the world from the perspective that there's a higher dimension. Mm. That the higher dimension is more difficult to perceive, but it doesn't mean it's not there. Mm. Whoever gets it right first fast and got that super quantum computer, they running everybody else. And how will you even know if they running you, especially if the computer is able to create a simulation so good that you don't know if you're in it or not. All of this metaphor is just a metaphor for merger of the left and right hemispheres of the brain through the optic chiasm to find your God self. I appreciate my pops for teaching me how to be a guy. From a boy to a man and ultimately back into the natural state of being into a guy. As guys, we're supposed to always move with that higher self. And I have to be able to execute it. Having knowledge is not power, the execution of knowledge is power. Knowledge makes a man unfit to be a slave. Because the only real knowledge you can get is knowledge of self. The highest level is power. The highest level is sovereignty. The highest level is higher countries. The highest level is when we own our own culture. Excellence at a very high level. Appreciate it. Not eye level. Mm. A high level. I like that. It's time for a high level conversation. Yeah, we're here for another high level another conversation. Another high level conversation. 19 keys and this is a high level conversation. Tap in with the guy. Peace family, 19 keys. Welcome back to high level conversations. I want to start this off a little different and I want to read something to you all that I believe will gather this conversation and bring it to consciousness to where I believe you can understand the value of why we're about to have the conversation that we're about to have. So I want to talk about INTJ and INTP, the Meyer Briggs mathematical types, right? It says, what type of people can hope to understand mathematics? We contend that as a generality, only four of the 16 Meyer Briggs personality types can be seriously mathematically literate. First of all, to be mathematically skilled, you have to be an introvert. Our definition of introvert is a simple one. An introvert is someone who enjoys his own company and does not go out his way to seek the company of others. An extrovert, on the other hand, enjoys the companies of others and goes out his way, avoid being on his own. To be a mathematician, you must have tremendous concentration, which implies being on your own without distractions. An extrovert, continuously distracted by the company he cultivates, never has the time and opportunity to be a deep thinker. Profound thinking is almost exclusively reserved for people who are capable of seeing or being in solitary for long periods of time. Secondly, mathematicians are usually highly intuitive. They can tune in, so to speak, to the mathematical fabric of the universe. Numbers, shapes, patterns present themselves as gifts to the intuitive. I believe in the customization of reality. Most people, when I first met him, he asked me what my number was, right? Because he's looking at the design of my spiritual, my genetic, my bio makeup. We're all different, right? Whether you believe in astrology or astronomy or whatever your belief system that falls upon you looking at below the surface of who you are, right? If you look at reality and you say, who am I? Then you can deconstruct that based on the, the details that make you who you are. Some people get A's in school because they happen to be great memorizers and they like taking in information from someone else that is in a hierarchy telling them what to do. Other people are creators and they want to go seek experiences or learn visual. So therefore they may not get a good grade, but it has nothing to do with their actual intelligence. And because oftentimes 
in environments, we don't have customizable environments based on your personality type or your human design, right? Or somebody reading your cardology <laughs> or astrology or whatever it may be. Your reality has never been customized towards your strengths. So most people are lost trying to find purpose because they're living out the perspective from the strengths that other people have found out about themselves that work. Or they're living out systems that was created by somebody who has a completely different personality or they have a completely different agenda for which is required for your life. I look at people all throughout the world and most people don't know who they are. They know their name, but they don't know themselves, right? They can't go beyond what's been told to them about who they are. So they don't know why they feel, judge, see, taste things, interpret things. They don't understand why they have intuitive connection with certain things because they weren't given a customizable set of knowledge about themselves to learn. If I was the CIA and I took a um, examination of you and I gave you a brief on who you are and I slid it across the table and there was a foul thick of information, you can use that information to then make decisions better, to understand why you don't like certain things. The same way if you took a test and you found out what you were allergic to, you would know what to avoid, how to increase your energy. I believe we're at that time now where human beings have to customize their reality based on who you truly are. Not what you are told about yourself, not your A's in school, not your degrees, not the views or comments or likes or whatever you hear. You have to really go into an in-depth process of learning who you are. Artificial intelligence allows people to do that because now you have technology that bypasses the process of the long staking, actually researching, which most people don't know how to do because school didn't actually teach you how to learn and it definitely didn't teach you how to research so as i have different conversations with people i realize you're polymathic that's why you don't want to do one thing you want to be in multiple universes you want to be in multiple dimensions but you're forced to settle for one and now you feel as if you're depressed because your energy has nowhere to express itself luckily for me i get to have high level conversations with people who are polymathic intuitive insightful geniuses who have found a way to tie all the dimensions together so that they can live out their purpose in multi-fields. And this next person that I have on the show is somebody who has done just that, a polymathic, mathematical, genuine human being in his pursuit and curiosities as he goes about being the Bruce Wayne of science. <laughs> I like that. I like that. <laughs> How you feeling today, Mr. I'm Robert? Happy to be here. Good to see you. Yes, sir. Yes, Likewise. Absolutely. So we go get into a great conversation. <laughs> <laughs> I want to start about, you know, your first question, one of your first questions to me was about, you know, what is my number? Mm -hmm. I want to know about your life path. My life path mm -hmm. number. By the way, strong open. Thank especially you. on Myers Briggs. Yes, sir. That was epic because I, I we never talked about this, yes. but like I'm big time into Myers Briggs. Okay, excellent. I've probably done it on at least thirty thousand people. Mm, what's yours? Mine is INTJ. Okay, I would thought so. Mm -hmm. But I've been a borderline E and I my whole life, mm. so I'm like right in the middle between those two. Uh, at different times in my life, I've become a lot deeper I, mm -hmm. especially in the last I'd say ten years. Yeah, I became a lot more I, um, but, and and also as time goes by, Myers Briggs, you you start to resolve and individuate your personality, and a lot of the things, the hard edges that you have, mm -hmm. that would cause extremes in whether you're going to be introverted or extroverted, intuitive or sensory, thinking or or judging, or mm -hmm. rather thinking or or um, uh, so ESTJ. So it's it's either in extroverted, introvert. Or uh, intuitive or sensory, thinking or feeling, mm -hmm. and then judging or perceiving. Those are the four different dimensions. So the, you know, there's only 16 different types of personality mm -hmm. types. You can combine them with numerology as well. And, and so if you're an INTJ one, like I would be, then that's going to really give you a lot of specificity. Combine that also with astrology. You've got a lot of specificity on mm -hmm. the life path that you're going to end up living. And the experiences yeah. and the challenges you'll face too. And you, and you find a thread of human beings that have similar or the same personality types that are rare, that are some of the great minds throughout the world that are misunderstood. But they have to be misunderstood because their personality type is rare. 
What's your What's your Myers Briggs? I'm INTJ as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah no, definitely. We resonate because yeah, because I feel like just talking with you before this that we definitely think similarly, see mm -hmm. things similarly in a very broad perspective, also. Mm -hmm. But um, yeah, I mean, I thought that was a very, very strong open, and I hadn't thought about it from the mathematics perspective, mm -hmm. but it's very true. Yeah, what you said. Well, I, I, I like to think about the world keeps us distracted all day, and our energy is constantly going out, 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 out. We're often in social environments mm -hmm. so that we don't have to think, right? And so most people can't come up with an original thought to save their life because they don't have any time to think for themselves <clears throat> to even true. develop their own pattern of thinking. Well, right? people are fighting for survival. A hundred percent. It's like you have to get out of the lower rungs of the Maslow's hierarchy or mm -hmm. the steps of Maslow's hierarchy of needs in order to get into higher order thought. Mm -hmm. If you're fighting for survival from one day to the next, you don't have time to think about self-actualization or self-transcendence. Well, no, because <laughs> that ain't got nothing to do with your bills. At That's right. So exactly. you gonna think about it. <laughs> you, your wife beating on yeah, you. Yeah. You have time to be, you know, I'm thinking about enlightenment, baby. No, that's not No, man, listen, I got bigger things. You see the planet and the way things are alive right now. Man, yeah. If you don't pay this light bill. <laughs> that's right. Exactly. <laughs> Talking about you enlightened and we in the dark. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> it so don't work true. like that. That's so You true. can't be woke and broke, man. If, if you right. consider yourself to be an enlightened being, learn how to use a resource sources of this world in a way to construct something for yourself. Exactly. Right. So I believe that there's a responsibility that comes along with enlightenment. I've gotten to that point where, you know, it's, it's, you get to a point where you have this understanding that nothing matters, right? You get to this ultimate edge of enlightenment and you can say, well, that's the case. Why do anything? But for me, being someone that lives in a world, I find it be irresponsible. To be in my enlightenment and try to just stay in this state of nirvana and bliss forever while ignoring all of the atrocities of the world. And I think, I think one of the big reasons we're here is to learn how to feel empathy for all of it. Mm. And if we just go into a solipsism approach and believe that, you know, all of it's fake, so why get, you know, freaked out about any of it? Mm. Uh, it's not real then that's not really enlightenment. I think you kind of missed the point. Mm -hmm. I think the point is really to learn here and to, to learn how to feel the feelings that are for every circumstance that come up. And the mm -hmm. only thing that maybe arguably that we could say is real in this life is what we feel. Mm. That's and so fact. that's like, I, I, I believe that simply the one divides itself into the many for the joy of perceiving itself through our own unique eyes of perspective mm. and perception. And that through doing that, the one, the universal one or God figure, and I think the entire universe is God, mm -hmm. becomes more wise because it can accumulate more and more wisdom by getting the sum of all possible subjective perspectives on any truth. I used to collect facts mm. until I realized that all the facts that I thought I was collecting were just my perceptions and really merely facets mm -hmm. of a larger truth, a larger prism of truth, and that the truth was somewhere in the middle of all of these things. If I could somehow accumulate as many different perspectives as possible, then I could achieve greater wisdom mm -hmm. and knowledge. And the purpose of that wisdom is to gain the empathy. Mm. Yeah, it's kind of like, you know, the knowledge you think you know and what you focus on is like a laser. And a laser is very, very powerful, right? It can cut through things, right? It can, it, it has people very sharp, mm -hmm. especially when they're completely immersed in their faith, their beliefs, their system, their thinking. But enlightenment is more like a rainbow. It's a spectrum of knowledge, yeah. right? But when a person has that focus, they can create, right? True. And man lacks focus. So you do have to draw down from the heavens of belief that you bring to earth so that you can build foundation. Mm -hmm. Right. But there are people who are existing as stars of ideas and feelings. Mm -hmm. Right. And then there are the mathematicians. Right. For me, it's thinking, feeling and math. Yeah. Right. You know, feeling, like you said, is is proof. It's proof of life. Mm -hmm. Right. It's personal proof of life. Right. I know I'm alive because I feel. Therefore, I'm alive. Mm -hmm. Right. And I am thinking. Right. Whether, you know, sometimes we can draw out layers of, you know, who's thinking of the thinker thinking. Right. And it kind of keeps going and you become a part of all this mind, like hermeticism. Mm -hmm. But when you're talking about math, math is a different level of proof. 
Math is God's proof, right? That he architects everything, right? My brother, Dr. Wesley says something. He say, God is a mathematician and a musician. Absolutely. Right? So when we think about him being a mathematician, he leaves, you know, his, his, um, his, his, his formulas everywhere for us to discover, right? When we go look at Imhotep, right? In mm -hmm. the Doja Step period, yep. mm -hmm. pyramids, he didn't have the literal equations written out for people, but it was left in his architecture, yeah, right? It was left in the beauty of his structures that you know for a fact that he has to know math in order to, to be that. able to create totally. and construct. So it's, it's that thing where it's like, you know, one person can have a fact about something, right? But then another person has evidence based on math. Right. And that's a conclusion of logic, because one says that logic is a branch of mathematics. Mm -hmm. Right. It's man's ability to think in a mathematical way, oftentimes without knowing the mathematical formula behind it. You know, it's interesting. I think of philosophy. But philosophy that's applied to me becomes mathematics. Mm, applied mathematics like becomes geometry. I look at philosophy as the art of thinking. Yeah. So. If, if applied philosophy is mathematics, then applied mathematics is geometry. Mm. Geometry is simply the music that we experience with our eyes. Mm. And applied geometry becomes physics. And applied physics becomes chemistry. And applied chemistry becomes biology. And applied biology becomes psychology. Mm. And applied psychology becomes sociology. And applied sociology becomes philosophy. It's a big circle. Mm. Each one is just a different perspective or angle or angel of looking at this one truth. Mm -hmm. We separate all of these different disciplines into different areas of study and never the twain shall meet. Mm -hmm. But actually, it's all interconnected. It's only us that perceives it as separate. This is a fact. And it's funny as you say the angels and angles, because that's the way I always look at it, right? The different dimensions. We've discovered different dimensions from a logical standpoint uh, through biology, right? Through chemistry. We either go dive deeper. Now you scroll on Instagram and you can see you know, uh, cells d replicating. One of my first science projects I ever did was on mitosis. Oh yeah, right? mitosis. the replication mm -hmm. of cells. But I've never thought about like we've discovered a whole nother dimension in the universe, and that exists in organisms. And then if we study those organisms, then we can create organization ourselves, right? So everything that man has created is just a study of self, right? Because Within us are already the answers. How do you create an organized system to breathe life, to construct things over time? Right? Well, look inside you. How do things that work? That can build itself. Yeah. Or so look at nature. imagine if we were making a game, right? So I, I, one of my projects, because uh, I'm an entrepreneur also, is to make a spiritual life simulation game. Mm. Okay. I bought the new Vision a Pro. spiritual life simulation. A spiritual life simulation game. And I believe- Slim. What's we that? are living in a spiritual life simulation game, interestingly. But I yesterday went to the Apple store and picked up the new the Vision spatial? Pro thing. Okay, yeah. Right, the spatial. Have, do you have one? Not yet. You know, I had the Microsoft HoloLenses. Um, I've, I had a HoloLens. I yeah, have a HoloLens I know that they don't compare, but that's where I, I was doing a lot of my study from there because I already knew that Apple was going to come with theirs and then reality was going Dude, to shift. I have it in my car. So when we're done, I got to show you this okay, thing. Yeah. It's going to blow your mind. Well, I already and, know. and the thing that's well, so... Well, we can get into spatial there. The whole thing that's so fascinating about this, because what I've done now is I wanted people, because I can't take everyone to Egypt with me. Mm -hmm. I do trips to Egypt. Mm -hmm. So I wanted people to be able to experience what it's like to go inside the Great Pyramid. And mm -hmm. not just the Great Pyramid, but all three pyramids. And, um, and so we, we made a game called Maya. Mm. And the game is you can go into the pyramids, right? You can go into the Great Pyramid, you can go through the Grand Gallery, and we took all the LIDAR images that exist that Harvard University was able to capture, and we stitched it all together into this world that's exactly photorealistic. Mm. Like, and you're in this world. Yeah. It's like totally real. So I can't wait to do it with these man you know i i had a conversation with my brothers it's probably 2021 um market mondays and we was talking about spatial computing where everything was going to go mm -hmm. right and we had gave that exact scenario about like everybody can't travel to egypt but there's <laughs> going to be <laughs> i'm probably throw the clip in here but somebody's going to be able to create the simulation of it right number one traveling expands you 
So everybody can't afford it, but that doesn't mean everybody shouldn't go. Exactly. Right. So I do believe in that. And we're about to go into spatial reality. Right. Which is a whole nother dimension. You know what's so crazy about this, though? What's so crazy about this and in this game, what we created was that there are hidden things all over the walls, mm. just like Dolores Cannon, who you may have heard of Dolores Cannon. She did all these past life regressions and found a lot of information that's fascinating. If you haven't read her book, Convoluted Universe, I highly, mm. highly recommend it. We'll check it out. She said that there were hidden things in the walls of the pyramids that nobody could see or understand until some people came along and could match the symbols because they had the right geometry in their auric field with the symbols that were on the wall. Mm. And I'll show you this stuff too, since it's part of this game. But basically the way that it works is you go to the game and you have to be able to pick out the things on the walls that have been found. This is real life stuff. And as you pick them out and are able to perceive them, you get downloads of information, right? Because geometry, whenever you see geometry, it's like a QR code for your subconscious mind. Mm. So, you know, we go to the restaurants during COVID, you use the QR code, it's mm -hmm. like has all the information for the menu. What if every time we looked at a new geometric shape or form, it was like bringing in new information into our consciousness? Mm, like a sigil. Like a sigil, exactly, because that's exactly what a sigil is, mm -hmm. and it does. So what we did is we created a game so that you have to find these things on your own, and as you do, you expand your consciousness, and you get to go and experience new things, right? which is like super cool, exciting. So I, I got this Vision Pro from Apple yesterday. And part of this package that comes is you get to play this dinosaur thing. I could not believe how realistic it was. It like literally blew me away. It opens a portal right in front of you and a freaking dinosaur that looks as real as you are sitting right in front of me. No joke. It's 8K display, Yeah, right? There's like no pixelation on it. And this dinosaur with all of its colors, the only thing I couldn't do, because it brought its face right up to my face, mm -hmm. like it was going to bite my head off. And I felt like I could smell its breath almost. Mm -hmm. right. That wasn't part of the game, but it was so realistic. I came to the conclusion that within probably five years, it will be absolutely impossible for us to determine reality versus virtual reality in this type of environment? Well, one would, that, that always goes to the question is, what is reality? So I believe that we are already in that simulation mm -hmm. game that's made by the one to increase its empathy, its wisdom, and knowledge. And if we were going to make a game, you and I, we would never make a game if we're already omnipotent, omnipresent, and omniscient. If we were all three of those things, we'd never make a game where we had all of those abilities because the game would be no fun. Mm -hmm. Right. It's like we would never play chess. Well, yeah, it's, it's what they call it in uh, like Marvel when somebody is OP. You know what I mean? Like they got too much power. Yeah. That is no fun. Yeah, it, it's no fun. So what we would instead do is we would design a game that would limit those powers mm -hmm. and that we would have to find those powers within us by learning these incredible principles, mm -hmm. learning more empathy and learning love and directing our consciousness game through a series of challenges and expansions that we could not remember any of why we came in the first place. Mm. Because it's the only way, just as we talked about earlier, if someone wants to really go deep into mathematics, they have to find it on their own. Mm -hmm. It's not something that other people can teach you. You have to learn to embed that knowledge and experience on your own. It's something that goes beyond the didactic learning and has to go to the true experiential learning. So in a spiritual life simulation, it's all about having the experience. Mm. And every experience that we have, even the challenges of difficulty and everything, you and I were both life path ones. We like a challenge. If we were mountain climbers, would we be satisfied climbing some small hill behind our houses? No. Nah. No. We'd be like, let's go take on the big one, yeah, right? You let's don't, go don't want to reach your zenith in it. You got you to go to, you got to live at your edge, your peak. Right, because that's the whole purpose. There's right? no point of... This almost saying there's no point of doing something you know you can do. That's right. Right. The flow is when skills meets challenge. That's right. Right. So I, if I don't have a challenge, then there's no effort. Then there's no reward. What's the point? It's no fun. Yeah. It's like there are so many times that like if you end up with a victory, whether it's work or otherwise, that you feel like you didn't really deserve. Mm -hmm. There's nothing worse than that, actually. Yeah. I mean, listen, I, as, as, as growing up in America, we have enough 
challenges, right? <laughs> I should say the least. Especially lately. Right? <laughs> so <laughs> we're not without, you know, where we can give effort is. I think the problem with a lot of people is that, you know, they stop challenging themselves in areas that matter, right? You get comfort corrupt, right? So, you know. Success you, breeds corrosion. Yeah. Once you, once you take care of your needs, that's when real life starts. That's right? so true. Because that's that's when you as a human being get to decide what you really want to do, not what you have to do. And some people have been living their life based on what they have to do. They don't know what they want to do. Right. And this is why I believe in the customization. And when we seek, you know, the, the present world is so boring. We got to go into the past to seek information and knowledge. The future is more, you know, uh, impressive to us than the present. The past is more impressive the, to us than the present. This is why we have archaeologists. This is why we have futurists, right? Because the time that we're living in is not enough for the expansiveness of our consciousness in order to, you know, uh, relieve our curiosity. A couple of hours ago, I was on a meeting with my math research team. Mm. And we talk about all kinds of stuff. So I've got mathematicians, physicists. I even have numerologists and and astrologist and like people that are experts in all these different areas, mm -hmm. but also polymathic in general. Mm -hmm. And one of the guys is from Brazil and uh, he works on my team. He's a fantastic guy named Gabriel, another mm. one named Gabriel. And he says, oh, this new Apple thing is incredible. He's like, you know, pretty soon you're going to be able to go in to a world and two, three, four, five people can all see the same thing in that world, but have entirely different interpretations of that <laughs> thing. <laughs> so I'm like, <laughs> I'm like, bro, you just described uh, what we're actually that, living in right now. Ain't that the funny thing, you know? You know what I mean? You put it in a different form and people are so impressed by life. They're all of a sudden, <laughs> totally. You put it in a different form, all of a sudden everyone's like, wow. That's what I'm saying. That was amazing. Human beings are, oh, we funny. It's funny. Like, I, I imagine if animals would watch shows on us, they'd think we crazy. <laughs> the things that we invent to enjoy life besides just enjoying life. Exactly. So we're going to escape to go in a game within a game within yeah. a game within a game. But the whole purpose for it that I think is so beautiful, actually, is and I came to this realization this last year when I started realizing, I'm like, wait, we it took me to actually start building a game mm -hmm. to realize that we're kind of in a game. Mm -hmm. And when I started realizing that and I started making the characters and everything, I'm like, how many people could play in this game. So we designed this game, Maya, to have 60 players all at once. But then we figured out there's a mathematical limit. Mm -hmm. And it was like 12, you know, uh, it was basically 12 squared mm -hmm. times 1,000 was like the mathematical limit, 144,000 mm -hmm. real players in the game. Yeah. Right? It's like the mathematical limit of complexity mm -hmm. that you could really want to deal with. And it's also kind of like beyond your zone of being able to know that many people personally. Right. Which right. is reality today. The 144,000 chosen ones. You know what I mean? If or you maybe there's just some players. Players. Probably like real real living players. You feel me? Like the, like I said, there's, there's most of the world are just going along. There's only certain people, interesting thinkers that create disruptions, uh, revolutions, breakthroughs. Those are the people that's alive. Everybody else. It's just like in the game, right? You're the player and everybody's just going about their mundane life, right? You about to break rules. You're looking for cheat codes. You on missions. But a lot of people, they just going to work, back, sleep, sex, money, party, vacation, depression, whatever it is. They're going through the same mundane cycle of reality. And then there's other players, right? That's out here trying to be presidents and kings and warlords and scientists and engineers and thought leaders and evolutionists. And they're just going about figuring out things that they can create or break. Right. Because it doesn't make sense for me to live my life. Like if nobody goes and plays, you know, um, a game to be like the NPCs. Mm -hmm. Right. Imagine you, you start playing the Sims or Grand Theft Auto. Grand Theft Auto. Yeah. And, you walk in and you, you know, if the whole game is just for you to get a job, just like the regular citizens in the game. You yeah. got to walk at their same speed, follow all of the mm -hmm. laws, get you a regular job and you do nothing else. You wouldn't play that game. Exactly. <laughs> yes. So many people are playing that game. That's the point. You said it earlier. It's like you put it in a different form and all of a sudden people are like, All of wow. a sudden I can get it. Because when you think about being a guy here controlling your avatar, you coming from a different perspective. That's why I talk to people about reaching your zenith. 
right? Your zenith is upward above head, right? It's a, it's a higher direction. So most people are like this. They're not pointing upward. And which means your viewpoint is always stuck here. It's the locality of your viewpoint. But we're supposed to be non-local. We're supposed to be superposition. We're supposed to have connection with things all throughout the universe. Things that I do have ripple effects not only throughout space, but time. So I don't, when, when you are existing beyond space and time, those are the ones that are really living. Because what you do matters, not even for just this small thread of your first cry, right? And your last, and you gone. But it actually matters because people will pick up your work your discoveries, yep. you have actually made a ripple throughout time. Mm -hmm. And you don't even know how far that will go. Exactly. It could go on and on. But, you know, it makes me think of 19, mm. your number, mm -hmm. right? Because I actually think of that, you said the word superposition, mm -hmm. non-local. Mm -hmm. So in quantum computing, we go from binary code to this trinary code. So mm -hmm. you've got ones, zeros, and Xs. The X can show up in either a position of one Mm. Or in zero. It can mm. play both, right? It's kind of like, you know, the liquid Terminator, mm -hmm. right? Remember the liquid Terminator could turn into anything? Yeah. Like you hit him and all of a sudden he just like remorphs and comes yeah. That's basically what, you know, this X position can do. It's interesting how much we keep seeing in our consciousness publicly about X and mm. the letter X, right? Twitter changes its name, right? Now it's like we have an X gender, Right. Everything right. is about my TV shows, even code X. Yeah. Right. And X can also have reference to Christ consciousness. Mm -hmm. The middle way, it's no longer yin yang, it's yin shen, mm. which is also another way of saying X. Mm. Right. Yin shen yang. I was just in Mexico. I was uh, measuring the pyramids that, that were in Chichen Itza and Ekbalam and Koba and all these other places. And as I found there's a pattern that links all of the pyramids around the world, it's, it's related to Orion constellation. But there's also another pattern that each pyramid represents a different musical note. Mm. Just like you were talking about with Imhotep. Imhotep, clearly, they used a lot of sound-based science, mm -hmm. right, in the Djoser complex. But if you look at the musical notes that it represents, right, even the Djoser pyramid represents the major second in music and the minor seventh. Mm. Because the slope angle, this 48.366 degrees, is exactly the proportions of 9 over 8, mm. right? And that's how you get a 48.366 degree angle when you got a height of 9 and a one-half the base of the pyramid mm -hmm. of 8 proportionally, right? All the pyramids at Giza Plateau are all music. The sound of music that they make is actually just this. It's not the close encounters. Everyone's like, is this going to be close encounters? Da, 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 da. The sound that it makes is da, 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 da. Literally, the slope angles, which no one ever had looked mm. at before and analyzed before. We did, our research team did, and we found that the exact slope angles were giving you the proportions of Menkari, the smallest pyramid on Giza Plateau, is five over four, height to one half its base. The next pyramid, Khafre, was four over three. The Great Pyramid is two over one pi, five, four, three, two, one. And that gives you exactly da, 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 mm. which is like, wait a minute. Is it only those pyramids or are there more? And then we found that it actually extends to Mexico. Mm -hmm. That's what I was just there measuring. And the missing notes of an octave and actually a 24-note scale instead of a 12-note scale filled out all the other positions around the world. So is this some sort of song? Could be, but uh, it also goes to, you know, cymatics and sound frequency, right? And that's the geometry. That's why you say, and, and, and it's a replication of what God does. Exactly. So there's this invisible hand behind it all that I find to be so compelling and so amazing. So coming back to the 19, how is it that one and nine, those two numbers, are akin to a superposition? Mm. Well, nine has this property that's unique, right? I saw this guy that I can't remember his name right now, but he did this rap. It was so epic. Oh, on yeah, the nine, right? About, oh, you yeah. saw this, right? I think he was with KRS One. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. KRS One, exactly. I watched this. I was like, wow, that was really good. I wanted to reach out to him. I got to reach out to him. But anyway, the point is, he's talking about the nine. The nine has this property that anything you add to the number nine in numerology, 
So coming back to what's called a digital root, will come back to the number that you added to it. So it's as if the nine never existed. So I'll give you an example. Nine plus four equals 13. But one plus three reduces down again to four. Mm. So nine plus four equals 13, but it's still four. So the nine didn't exist. So anything you add to nine will have this exact property related to it. So mm. nine plus six right, equals 15, but one plus five equals six. So where'd the nine go? The nine like disappears. So this unique property gives it the same position as zero. But if you take 0.999999999 and take it out infinitely, does it ever become the number one? And the answer is yes, there's a mathematical proof done several times by mathematicians, famous mathematicians throughout history, Leonard Euler being one, that proved that nine or 0.99999 repeating does equal one. It, it's not that it approximates to one, it actually equals one. And so when you look at that, then you start realizing, okay, does this somehow tell us something about how the number nine can both hold the properties in its repetition cycle as one and also act as zero? Mm. This is a superposition number. So therefore, like 19, one and nine have both of those characteristics and properties in them. It's almost like an alpha omega. Mm -hmm. You could think of it like that. So when you start to dig a little bit deeper and pull this thread a little bit further, you start realizing, well, okay, well, how can we show this in mathematics? And what does this relate to esotericism and, and divinity, for example, or philosophy? And I was asked last week to go to Las Vegas to meet with a billionaire who wanted to be proven that God exists through mathematics. Mm. Kind of interesting thing, right? And who else? Yeah. I was like, what the heck am I doing? I used to be a farmer CEO. Now I'm flying to Las Vegas to meet with a billionaire guy who is genuinely curious, wants to understand if God exists and if that it can be proven mathematically. And for him and his, you know, his relatives that were also involved in this, he, uh, he has a very important case that's worth billions of dollars. And they all believe that they need to believe in God. So therefore, they're like, there's a lot riding on this, Robert. You got to prove to him that God exists. And not God from the standpoint of like some old, you know, guy with white hair, mm -hmm. but rather that the whole universe is intelligent. Mm. So I started off with zero to the power of zero equals what? And of course, most people would answer zero to the power of zero equals what? What would you mm. expect it to be? zero. Most people would expect it to be zero, but the answer is actually one. So if you have your phone, pull it out for a second. Okay. So if you take zero to the power of zero, how could we find without just using that as the equation to define it as the number one, right? And if you go on Google calculator right now and do zero to the power of zero, it'll just give you the answer is one. Okay. Mm -hmm. So I'll just cheat for you right now. You know that much. But let's go beyond that to understand why does zero to the power of zero actually equal one in truth, not just because it's some mathematical definition that somebody came along and said, it must be so. So let's take a smaller number, right? And take, you know, 0.5 to the power of x to the y right here. That's how you do it. The same 0.5 equals 0 0.707, right? 0.707. Mm-hmm. Now, if I go with a smaller number, will the result be larger? So 0 0.05, the last time was 0.5, to the power of 0 0.05 equals 0 0.86. Mm. That's bigger than 0.707, right? So let's go 0 0.005 to the power of 0 0.005 equals 0 0.97. So let's do 10 zeros. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. 8, 9, 10. So 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 5 to the power of 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 5. And it's 0 0.9999998. You see what's happening? It's converging to 1. Mm -hmm. So as I approach 0, 0 to the power of 0 equals 1. Mm. That means nothing to the power of nothing equals yeah. everything. I mean, it's, 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 it's a mathematical equation for a self-created God into man. 
Exactly. The Honorable Elijah Mama said in um, Theology of Time, um, lightly quoting him, but he was given an explanation. You say you, you, you take a cipher out there as a zero by itself, mm -hmm. right? And <clears throat> he was explaining how man is empowered by God, right? You have a one out there. And if you put a zero in front of that one, right, then it's still a one. But that zero represents God, that cipher of unlimited mm -hmm. potential. Mm -hmm. But he was explaining when you believe in God, then, then God gets behind you, then you are multiplied, right? And he was explaining that we go from nothing into something when we have a belief in God and when we are with God. And there are many of us out here they just by themselves. But you're not multiplied until you have that belief in God, until you're operating from that power. But as you talk about, you know, the zero to the power of zero, zero to the power of zero equals one. It directly correlates right with the belief that, you know, I think it was Tahuti that talks about God falling from heaven and becoming mm -hmm. man. Right. Mm -hmm. It's the ascension process, the ascension protocol. Right. We start off formless and then we become vertical men standing up. Right. That's our representation. So I was always taught about if you look out in the vastness, the darkness of time in the universe, how does God create himself out of nothing from nothing? Motion. Here's the math of it. When once motion begins, that's the first law within the universe. And then you put order to that motion. This one got the Isolist CBD, the Black Sea Oil, the MCT Oil, and the Lion's Mane Powder. I think it's too much in here. I think we need to calm, we gotta calm this product down. We gotta calm this product down. It's too much. It's too much. Bro, I took this and I was going all day. Ain't nobody got that much work to get done in a day where they need to be taking Supermind. Like, what if you are, you a house mom and all of a sudden you get everything done in one day and you ain't got nothing to do the rest of the week? I took this, I don't know what I'm supposed to do with the rest of my life. I feel like I didn't got everything done. I was up, right. right. I ain't gonna lie, I feel like I changed the world a thousand times on this. I done figured out every single plan. The next thing I need to have is patience because I done, I done planned everything. I done did everything I could do in a day. I'm serious. Like, I think we put too much in here. We need to cut down the ingredient list and we need to make this regular mind because this is like Viagra for the brain. If you look at the number six, mm -hmm. right? Six the is a number. Yes. If that, that same six, of course, we see that frequency within the universe. We see it in the seashells. We see mm -hmm. it all over, right? But that number six represents what? It also represents man, right? And in that representation, it, it's a perfect representation of God power stored in physical form, right? So if you want to see, you know, you talk about matter, matter, of course, is energy stored, but within man, you know what I mean? Man is where God is stored in matter, right? And there's no other perfect representation than that. Man is the only one who asked the questions in the first place, right? Man is the only one who wants to get to know God, right? Because he wants to get to know self. Man is just seeking an understanding of self at all times. Yep. And we find the most beautiful ways to get to that discovery. And whether you think you believe in God, in one way or another, you do. The scientists may not think they believe in God, but when they come up with these equations, all they're doing is finding proof of someone else's belief, right? And you call it something else. And because you may not go with the word God does not mean that that what you are describing is not God. Exactly. No, that's, that's we started out talking also about, you know, personality type. Mm -hmm. And I tend to think of that which I know I know is what I call my conscious mind. Mm. That which I know I don't know could be analogously my subconscious mind. Mm -hmm. And then there's something beyond the border. You know, once you go past the, I know what I know, I know what I don't know. So I'm not an ice skater and I know I don't know how to ice skate well, so I don't really know ice skating. Mm -hmm. But then there's another realm beyond that, which is the, I don't even know what I don't know. Mm. 
You see what I'm saying? Yeah, that's the best part right there. So the I don't even know what I don't know, we tend to call that something in science as we call it entropy. Mm. Entropy means randomness, mm -hmm. right? But that could just be the boundary of where our knowledge ended and our ignorance began, our true ignorance, mm. right? I, mean, I don't need to be a physicist per se to know that I don't know physics. Mm. Someone else might know physics. Okay, fine. But then there's this realm that's beyond that, and we tend to think of that as being devoid of pattern. What if it's all patterned? What if all of it is patterned? Because from a mathematics perspective... Then there is no true empathy there. Entropy. Entro there's no true entropy. I don't believe in entropy. Because this kind of saying, can you create a non-mathematical universe? Is the properties beyond mathematics strong enough to create anything substantial? Right. And I don't think anybody can composite a thought to say yes. Well, so when you think about this, right, I have discovered many patterns now in mathematics. And I've come to realize that every time I've searched for a pattern, the pattern was found. Mm, mm. But our science doesn't want to find patterns because That's as soon as you find a pattern, that implies that there is a God. Mm. And people don't feel comfortable with that in general, right? Or Maybe not a God figure, but there's some intelligent design. Right. It's not random, right? So the next thing I was trying to show is that if you have even one pattern within a sea of supposed randomness, then you cannot rule out that the entire sea of randomness is not entirely patterned. But we know science disregards things that don't fit the common scientific consensus. That's right. And because if you think about it, though, science is the one thing that all of our knowledge is constantly changing. Mm -hmm. You know, we thought a certain way about things. Hey, back in the 40s, smoking was healthy. <laughs> yeah. Right? Then we have vaccinations and everyone's like, oh yeah, you gotta do it, just follow the science. And now people are going, uh, yeah, you know, there were something like 1,131 deaths that happened within 90 days that were hidden, mm -hmm. you know, from the clinical trials and mm -hmm. that kind of just got swept under the carpet. But now it's all coming out. Right. So what we think of as science, it's the one thing that's constantly changing. Yeah, I mean, science has these, science is a religion unto itself that does not want to admit that it's a religion, right? Well, we th call this scientism. Yeah, I, I, it's like science, science, science has a, a, a problem with their father. I think science has daddy issues. <laughs> okay, explain that. <laughs> I gotta hear that. So what are the daddy issues of, of science? I feel like science is, you know, never wants to call their dad by their name. They figure out all these other ways to describe why <laughs> they are in existence, why they got a roof over their head, why they get to breathe, why things work. And That's mom's so like, you know, your daddy abandoned you. You feel me? But behind the scenes, dad was always the one who supplied everything. But even when he comes back, and it's logical that dad must be paying for this because mama not working. So I'm like, I got to be paying for this. I had to get here somewhere. My dad had to exist. <laughs> this is good. They got abandonment issues. They don't ever want to say their daddy name. You know what I mean? And what do, what do religious people call a holy father? Scientists don't have a father. Not a holy father. They got daddy issues. <laughs> All right, I'm going to use that again. I'll quote you on that one. That's a good one. Science has got daddy issues. Yeah, dude. You know what I mean, it's okay. You can recognize your father. Your father by any other name is still your father. But you know what's funny is that you talked about man being, you know, related to the number six. Well, that makes me immediately think of the hexagram, mm. right? Which is the Star of David or Metatron's cube or there's so many different names for this, right? We, and it's not just in... In Judaism, it shows up everywhere, mm -hmm. right? Literally shows up everywhere. I don't know if you guys saw the latest Johns Hopkins research also that showed they did a kind of 23andMe test. And if you get a, have you done 23andMe? Unfortunately, I have. I did too. I did it too. And now I wish I didn't do it because now they have all my data. <laughs> but, you know, I found out, you know, where my whole family was from and everything. Yeah. And so that was kind of, that part of it was cool. Well, they found that the people that were living and without getting too controversial here, but this is Johns Hopkins' study that just came out, the people that uh, were living in Palestine were actually from that area of the world mm. at the time of the biblical time, mm -hmm. right? 
and that the people that are living in Israel now don't actually have that DNA. Now, you can argue, hey, right or wrong or whatever, and I'm certainly not a fan of what happened with the Holocaust. In fact, I've been a very outspoken proponent Mm -hmm. of, uh, you know, making sure that we never have those kinds of issues come up again, ever again. Unfortunately, we have them today. And we have one today. And it's, it's interesting how it basically flipped, right? Because I've been to Yad Vashem, and I, I find it a terrible travesty that we can sit here and justify the death of tens of thousands of people and, you know, thousands and thousands, at least 40% would be children mm-hmm. under the age of 10. And say, oh, it's because we're going after the bad guys. Mm -hmm. You know, to me, this is like, it reminds me of Saul Alinsky, who was a social agitator, who wrote that our world is not a world of angels, Mm -hmm. rather it is a world of angles. Mm -hmm. A world where men speak of moral principle, yet act on power principle. A world where we are always moral and our enemies, whoever they are, are always immoral. Mm -hmm. This is the, unfortunately, too much of uh it's taken over many many of the chapters of the human story Mm -hmm. and i think that part of it's got to end but when i start thinking about the six and your point i think of metatron's cube i think of the vitruvian man also by leonardo da vinci because that's also Mm -hmm. tied to the same thing and within six point perspective you can create all geometric forms Mm. so all of the platonic solids that we know of and it could be that you know plato got all of this information who knows, uh, from the Egyptian mystery schools. We know he went. We know Socrates went to the Egyptian mystery schools, but the Egyptian mystery schools didn't want to be quoted anyway. So we're thankful, at least, to the Greeks for having left records for us to basically find. Mm. But what's interesting about it is the platonic solids are, you know, it starts with a tetrahedron. A tetrahedron is a shape that would be an equilateral triangle into a three-dimensional object, so four sides of equilateral triangle, right? Then you have uh, a cube. So Mm -hmm. you've got, you know, a cube would be six sides of a square, right? And and then you have uh, an octahedron. So the way that would get formed is you would take the center point of a square and connect the center points of each of those six sides, and it creates a shape that looks like a pyramid and an inverted pyramid, Mm -hmm. right, attached to it. Then you've got an icosahedron, you've got a dodecahedron, and then some would argue an icosidodecahedron, which would be the combination of the two, because... Again, if you took an icosahedron, which is supposed to be the structure of water clusters, take the center point of it and attach all of those and connect the dots of it, you'd have a dodecahedron. So one is part of the other, without a doubt. How is it that every single form that's regular in the universe, regular meaning it only has, like a dodecahedron, it has basically 12 sides of pentagons. Mm. So perfect pentagons, they're regular pentagons. How is it that all forms of life are based on these structures. Plankton is the exact shape of a dodecahedron. Icosahedron is the shape of COVID. The structure is a truncated icosahedron. Every single shape that exists in the universe in regular form can be made inside of, without any measurements whatsoever. I don't need to measure anything. I can make all of those forms perfectly in perspective geometry inside of the Star of David, inside of the Merkaba. To me, that implies a level of design that is so far beyond anything we could ever have constructed, and it implies a, an architect behind all of it. Mm. And it goes beyond implying it. That, in combination with zero to the power of zero, says that, to me, unequivocally, there is definitely a God. Mm-hmm. And we have a purpose for being here. But math, We try to learn math without meaning. Math without meaning is just banal information. It means nothing. So we have a hard time learning it. People struggle to learn mathematics, and they get a bad relationship with mathematics in junior high. But doesn't math come from, not to cut your wisdom, uh, essentially meant learning at first? Yes, mathematics, actually the word mathematics did not mean the science of quantity Mm -hmm. until Aristotle. At Plato's time and before that, Mathematics just meant learning. That's why the word polymath just means many, poly, Mm -hmm. learning. Mm -hmm. That's it. So it was synonymous with all learning because mathematics was just the language of all learning. Right. You know, another thing people don't realize is this was an age, Greeks didn't have numbers like we have. They used letters to describe their numbers. So the letter alpha was the number one. The letter, you know, beta 
mm. was the number two. Mm. And this was true also in Hebrew, in Phoenician, mm -hmm. in all the ancient languages. Mm -hmm. They were all using uh, you know, their letters to represent their numbers. It wasn't until we had the benefit of having uh, the Arabs come up with the Arabic numeral system, mm -hmm. right? And we got all of the numbers that we currently have. But when you think about that, that means that all of the things that were written had both a literary meaning and a mathematical meaning. 100%. And this is what, there's a whole study of this that people have long ignored, which is called gematria, mm -hmm. right? And so there are hidden codes within the Bible that people that study this stuff swear by mm -hmm. because they can find these hidden codes inside of it because that's the way it was written in the first place. Yeah, I think that's, that's the language part that many people don't understand. As you may um, be a discoverer of it today, mm -hmm. it was the norm, right? Yeah. And back in the day. So even as you go and you decode these different paintings and these sites and you find the math, right? But even then, as you talked about, you know, you, you speak a lot about uh, Pythagoras. Mm -hmm. Pythagoras had his own system. As you talked, the Egyptians didn't want people spilling the secrets. The math, if you have, you are a math mind, right? And, and, or a math man, I should say. Mm -hmm. And in Latin, you know, man means mind, right? Um, so for me, it's about a learning mind, right? Mm -hmm. The inquisitive, curious mm -hmm. mind that wants to learn. Everybody is not there. Even in today, we have all the information. Yeah. Everybody doesn't want to learn mm -hmm. this type of information. So that wasn't for everybody, though. When you learn things, you got to still take that vow of silence, right? There was a certain period of time. In That's which what you the Pythagoreans all had to do. Yeah, they had their own court system about learning and then being silent about the things they learned. Right. Because everything is not for everyone, because here's the thing about even when we're teaching, you don't just empower your peers, you empower your enemies when you speak out loud in the public. Mm -hmm. Right. So it's like you may be giving away information to a formula that is about fusion energy. All right. Now you can make that open source, but, you know, your enemies get it open source as well. Mm -hmm. And those are the people you don't want to have it. Yeah. So the secrecy is a protection. Because if it falls into the wrong hands versus it falls into the right hands, you don't mind a good man having a gun. It's the bad man that got the gun that you got a problem with. Mm -hmm. Right. So a good man, it could be millions of them that have guns and never use it the wrong way. You get one person. Right. The wrong person. He can take many lives. And this is why information is a weapon. And it has always been weaponized throughout time to keep certain people blind, deaf and dumb mm -hmm. because they know that if you get the information, it's dangerous. Right. And there are certain things that they're not even worried about the public getting anymore because the public is no longer mathematical thinking. That's right. We're in the now are in the domain of the emotional public and the emotional public. It takes on the animus of the feminine aspect so they can be easily swayed right through feeling. But now even men are in their feminine animus aspect as well. So now it's feeling over fact. We that post era of truth. I like having these conversations about mathematics because it's I got to get people to think about things in a very logical way. But I, I do want to uh, add this to the conversation. We talked about the number 19, talk about the X. Of course, me growing up in a nation in Islam, Elijah Muhammad always give you the X, right? When you're turning from a slave name into a righteous name. But in that transitional phase, right, you get like a Malcolm X. And Malcolm X was born on the 19th of May. Right. So he is also a 19 key the way I look at it. Right. But, you know, he had that X and that X, like you said, it solves for that unknown. You know what I mean? Because it's a bridge. It's an arc. Right. To where you get to become more than what you are. It's a rebirthing. Right. So let's take the name that you got mm -hmm. because that represents a structure. Mm -hmm. If I call you by your name, that's mm -hmm. a sound design. Mm -hmm. Right. So now your geometrical structure is stuck to that name. Now, if you belong to somebody else, when I call your name, I'm really calling their name. Yep. So you can't evoke your power. Mm -hmm. So that's why today, you know, um, it's important for people to have a name that fits the qualities of the destiny that they want. You understand me? And we always have to observe deeper because sound, as you talked about, the sound design of the world is geometry. We find it every single yep. where. And those patterns are every single mm -hmm. where. Mm -hmm. And nothing is random. Nothing is right? random. There, <laughs> if, you, if you ask enough whys, you will find the logic. Yeah. Right? It's usually five whys. You ask why, you go deeper enough, 
Now you get to understanding. Mm -hmm. Most people quit at one or two or three, mm -hmm. right? They don't go further beyond their yep. scope of understanding. So I want to know for you, though, as you go into things like the Vitruvian Man, as you go into things like um, The Last Supper by Leonardo da Vinci, right? What, what, first of all, what have you found that is so compelling that it keeps you intrigued to look for more and more and more? It's exactly what you're talking about. So this concept of X, you're talking about Malcolm X and May 19th, I'm May 16th, by the way. Okay, yeah. So it's no, just the same number upside, upside down. down. Yeah, okay, okay. Yep. You know some math. <laughs> mm -hmm. So you have to be able to look at math as a mirror reflection, at least in four dimensions, mm. right? And that's an important aspect of it. But part of the reason also that X becomes so critically important is because we have a right brain. Mm-hmm. And we have a left brain. Mm -hmm. So our left brain is the rational seat of thought. So if I look at my left temporal lobe, that's where my brain processes numbers and mathematics, number theory, et cetera. I look at the right temporal lobe. So it's just the exact same anatomy of the brain, but on the opposite side, that's where my brain processes music. So you got math and music. Mm -hmm. Now language is at the center of the brain. Right? It's slightly more to the left side. And then you've got geometry right around the center as well. Mm. That's why geometry is so powerful, it's like a QR code for the subconscious mind, to awaken mm. this electrical canopy around your pituitary gland and your pineal gland. Geometry is the doorway mm. to being able to do that. Now, it's interesting because our right eye connects to the left hemisphere of the brain. Mm. The left eye connects to the right hemisphere of the brain. It creates an X. Mm -hmm. Those optic nerves create an X right at the pituitary gland mm -hmm. called the optic chiasm. Yeah, the suprachiasmatic nucleus. That's right. So when the X is activated properly, you can see both with the rational mind as well as with the intuitive mind. Mm. You can combine the, the benefits of masculine and feminine together, right, and have a more balanced society. Mm. And so what you're saying is now we're making this Trans, we're crossing the transom, going from the left brain, mm -hmm. which it was for my growing up years. Yeah, becoming X Men. Yep, becoming X Men. Isn't that funny? Mm -hmm. Right, activating that junk DNA, so called, that dormant. There's that no lies. such thing as junk. You know, That's one man's trash, so another man's treasure. Yeah, you just got to activate it. You just got to understand what it what it's there for, and that you can activate it. And bringing it into our awareness is nine tenths of it. Mm -hmm. You literally have to realize that you are that. You are that. You have the ability to become a more evolved divine human being. Mm. But it's not going to be for everyone. Because as Leonardo da Vinci says, there's three types of people. Those who see, mm. those who can see once they're shown by someone else who can see, mm -hmm. and those who simply don't see. Mm. And that's okay, because the world needs that too. Mm. There's a new movie that just came out on Netflix this last week called Orion. Mm. Orion's also big in the consciousness right now. Orion and the Dark. And it's a story about a little boy who's terrified of the dark. It's a car cartoon kind of a show. It seems like it's for kids, but it's actually an adult type movie. Yeah. And the whole story is about this kid who wants to overcome his fears. And he's paralyzed by fear. He's afraid of everything. He wants to go on this field trip to this planetarium, and he, he decides he can't go. And so... In the middle of the night, he's sleeping, he's terrified of it. The next day, the dark shows up in his room as a monster and carries him off for a full day. Mm. Goes around the world and brings darkness to the world. And he gets an appreciation that darkness is necessary mm. for light and life. That the darkness is what makes the light have its contrast. That, that darkness is not the absence of light. Rather, it's simply the absorption of it. So if we look at the electromagnetic spectrum, you have certain colors that on the spectrum are wheel of colors that will have its opposite. Well, that makes sense, yeah. I mean, that's where you get melanin. It's, that's right. So you get melanin? Of, of radiant, radiation, which is light. Yeah, so the chair you're sitting on is blue. It's like mm -hmm. a pale blue. But actually, the color that we would be looking at for a pale blue like that, that's the reflection. Its absorption is probably like a yellowish color, mm. right? because that's its opposite along the color wheel. Mm. As it gets more towards greenish blue, it's gonna have its absorption be red, right? It'll be orangish and then red. So it's, you've got these opposite colors. So the opposite of white 
white and black are actually the same color. Mm. One is just absorbing and the other is reflecting, mm. but it's the same in the color spectrum. White is reflecting all colors and black is absorbing all colors, mm -hmm. right? There's really no difference though. We look at it as black and white, even on yin yang, and we say, oh, that's the light and that's the dark, and we can make and ascribe certain values to each one of those things, but actually it's just absorption and reflection. It's really not different at its core. It's just we're only seeing one aspect of the white. In order for the white to exist, the black must be absorbed. In order for the black to exist as reflection, the white must be absorbed. Mm. You understand what I'm saying? So we're not so the, the, we don't have the difference in differentiation that we want to apply to everything. It's just the way we see the world because we don't see the world as it truly is. We see the world as we are. So we well, apply yeah, then most value. We live in a perceptions of reality. And how can we separate? It's hard to separate my conditioning biases from the way I experience the world. Well, yeah, I mean, when you talk about the womb, everything comes out of the womb, right? Um, if you talk about the universe, the universe is triple darkness. Everything comes from there, right? And it's like in the movie Matrix. Nobody ever talks about the fact that, you know, Matrix in Latin means womb, right? And that's all it was. It was the womb, right? And we are all, for me, I look at the darkness as an arc, right? The dark, the arc, right? It's a bridge. When you go through the dark night of the soul, you have to go into the darkness, right? You have to be like a seed to grow back into the ground to come out again a new shape because you're all bent out of shape. Your frequency is all disarray. You're in chaos. What you thought was going to be is no longer, right? So now mm -hmm. it's, like, it's like somebody that's uh, prepared themselves for a relationship. They're in the mode of being a lover. I'm going to do this. Mm -hmm. Then something happens. They lose a loved one. Then mm -hmm. all of a sudden, being a lover doesn't work in this current state to deal with this new reality. Mm -hmm. So now you have to go back in the darkness, right? Become a new shape that fits to deal with the current state of reality that you have to go into. So a lot of people get stuck in the darkness because um, in reality, you know, we don't often feel as if the things that we get from the darkness, sometimes we can share with people in the light. Yeah. Right. And not having that space to go through the darkness correctly. Some people feel more comfortable in the dark. You know what? I'll just stay here. And when you get stuck in there, because some people dark nights last for two years, three years. Some people should last forever until you did. Right. But your goal is to go to the darkness and grab the power out that you need to absorb the light, absorb the energy, then come out being a reflection of that, which you've learned. Yeah, that's beautiful. And so that's exactly what this show is about, that it's really about learning how to merge with the aspects of yourself that you're afraid of mm. and learning how to integrate those. You talked about animus, mm -hmm. anima, animus. That's exactly what we all have to do when we go. Th hopefully that's the purpose of going through the dark night of the soul mm -hmm. is you realize that the aspects of yourself that you had judged negatively. And I don't believe the world's a difficult place because people hate each other so much. I think the world can be a difficult place because we hate ourselves. And the more we hate ourselves, the more difficult experience we have in this world. I read this funny meme the other day, and it was quite good. It said, you know, um, if you, what was it? I keep encountering assholes in my life, right? But maybe it's because I'm a grouchy person, right? So it's like, we are what we judge. Mm -hmm. In essence, we will attract what we judge until we no longer judge what we attract. Yeah, it's the traits that we like but don't even know. And this is why going deeper into layers matter. You can get some, it's like for men, if men has to have dark traits mm -hmm. in order for them to be loved by women, right? And I'm talking about- So true. If you don't have, because those this dark traits- This could be traits, a whole, whole long conversation. Yeah, I'm a, <laughs> but just, just a brief, because that is a whole, that's a whole deeper. But it's like a man, she wants a man that's confident. She wants a man with influence and power. Right. In order to get those things, you're going to have to have dark traits. So the problem is. And is not that, be very empathetic. Yeah. And she's attracted to those things. And she, why do I keep finding these things? That's what you're attracted to. Right. Men that have power, have influence, that have money, that have these things in this world, you're going to have to have these dark traits, that charisma, right? That confidence that that person goes about in the world, that hunt, that shark, that lion. Those are the dark traits, but you also have to have the light traits. Yeah. And if you got both, Right. And you're all the things. Oh, she wants to marry you. She's in love with you. But if you just got the light traits, you get put in that friend zone. 
<laughs> never get to the end zone. <laughs> friend zone never get to the end zone. Yeah, you get to the friend like zone that. fast. <laughs> That's a good one. You know, women always say tall, dark, and handsome, but the dark really represents the dark traits. Oh, without a doubt. Yeah. Without a doubt. So that's that's the thing. We all get in these situations where we want to judge our darkness. And we don't realize that the more we do that, the more we separate the world around us mm -hmm. from where we actually want to be. And that is the true separation is light and dark. Those who fall upon that spectrum. I, I, I observe a man based on their righteousness, right? You can be a part of my tribe if our ethics and our values align. Well, and you know what? It's, it's interesting because I believe fundamentally that every, every human being has an equal amount of dark and light within them. And that some people are aware of their darkness and others are not. For those that are aware of their darkness, they're the ones who actually are the most tame in society and can find balance. They can be both spiritual and grounded at mm. the same time and manifest. They can do X position, right? Which is that you can actually become a superposition. You're, you're non-local. For those that are unaware of their dark aspects and they think that all they are is light because I've never encountered a villain who thought they were a villain. Mm. They always think themselves a hero. So what happens is they often believe that they're only light within them. And so they, then they, they want to impose their righteousness, right? And, and do it in a way that's just an angle rather than an angel. Well, you know, what's interesting. I call those, you know, in, in Greek, the 19th alphabet as well. The 19th letter of the alphabet? Uh-huh. Uh, in the Greek, in the uh -huh. Greek alphabet? Do you know what it? is that? Is it, um, is it theta? Tau. Tau. I knew, I knew it was T. So I, I call tea. it the tall mills, mm -hmm. right? It's like Taurus. Taurus, right? right. Um, you know, being a Taurus, you know, speaking of, like Malcolm X is a Taurus. I'm mm -hmm. a Taurus. Me too. Right. That, that's another thing. I, I say, know that. When's your birthday? I get it. Nah, I get it. When's I get it. May 4th. May 4th. Yeah. Okay. So I'm May 16th. Uh, so we're, we're both Taurus, Life Path 1, yeah. and INTJ. Yeah, Dude. it's the bull. The bull. The bull. You know what I'm talking about? <laughs> You know, that, that goes deep. I, I seen you breaking down the Yave, Yavahe, mm -hmm. you know, and the correlations of the sevens, right? Going into the bull. And I find so many correlations and so many synchronicities as I go about life, of course. Right. But for me, like that tall male is kind of like a Wolverine, mm -hmm. right? Wolverine was a good guy with all the dark traits, mm -hmm. right? But Jean Grey wanted them, Storm wanted them. And I used to think that I resonated with that character because of his power, but it was really because of his traits, mm -hmm. right? I see the, the anti-villain is more relatable than the perfect hero, yep. right? Because in real life, there's no perfect heroes, right? The anti-villain is always someone who is more human, someone mm -hmm. that can resonate mm -hmm. and we can relate with, mm -hmm. right? And this is what you start to see the rise of today is the rise of the anti-villain, right? I'm not perfect. Trump represents the idea of the anti-villain for many, mm -hmm. right? That they feel like this is somebody going against the establishment, the establishment <clears throat> and the world is anti-establishment today. But what most people don't realize is that the power class and the management class of this world operate on completely different laws than the average man, right? You obviously are a learned man and you are on a conquest of learning, which means that you are in different circles. Right. And in those circles, people enjoy, appreciate, acknowledge and honor and give reverence to knowledge. Mm -hmm. Right. And there's certain access that you can't get unless you are part of that circle. Very true. Right. And this is what I find in, in, in is interesting just in circle itself, because everybody has to create them a circle. Mm -hmm. Right. As mm -hmm. we talk about geometry, if you want to know part of the art of life is to creating you a circle. Absolutely. Right. That's that foundation to where you're going to be able to create flow in your life and motion within your life. And associate with people like you, mm. right? Like, you know, I became good friends with Billy, yeah. our mutual friend. And, um, and then we both foster relationships to expand our circle, mm -hmm. right? And we find people of like mind. Like you're clearly like that. You're, as a, you're a manifesting uh, persona that can actually create things 
So you're both spiritual and you're grounded. That's part of your tourist thing. Mm -hmm. you, you'll always be that. You'll always have the strong leadership ability and people will always listen to your voice because first of all, Taurus controls the throat chakra. Right. Throat chakra is leadership, mm -hmm. right? And we're going through a global throat chakra awakening. You've got G on your bottles mm -hmm. right there, right? That represents the note G, which is the throat chakra. Mm. You didn't even realize that you're the Taurus sitting mm. in front of this letter G, mm. which Big is G. the throat chakra sitting in your chair. You know what? I just opened up this book because I was going to ask you about something about G. Mm -hmm. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> so let me answer your other question first. No, I'm going to let you get to it. Yeah. So you, you asked me the question about what do I find with Da Vinci's paintings and everything? Mm -hmm. Why is it? Oh, I'm glad you sharp. You remembered that. So what he did was he is basically pushing us towards the understanding and awareness that with a global throat chakra activation, and I just got back from Egypt and that's what we finished. We've now finished the throat chakra activation. There are three layers of the throat chakra, which is mm. self-awareness is the first layer. The third, the second layer is self-actualization and the third layer is self-transcendence. Self-transcendence allows you to see beyond duality, which is you can, so let's say that I'm holding, uh, uh, let's say that I'm holding that cylinder over there, right? You've got that little cylinder. Can I grab that? So if I were holding this in front of the camera and I said to you, and you could only see this direction, you can't see I'm holding a cylinder, mm -hmm. and you'd see a shadow cast on the wall behind me that makes the shape of a circle, you could say, oh, that's a circle you're holding. Mm -hmm. But someone sitting this direction, right, looking this way, looking at the shadow cast this way from these lights, would say, no, it's like a long rectangle, mm -hmm. right? Only I have the benefit, if right. they're limited in their perception, of knowing that both are right. Mm. It's a cylinder. So both are right, yet both are wrong, mm. right? At the same time. Because the higher knowledge, it's another dimension. Mm. And it's a cylinder. Mm. We do this all day long. We argue about things that we see from our perspective. We don't even realize that there's a higher order way to see it. Mm -hmm. What Da Vinci is teaching us through his paintings is to see the world from the perspective that there's a higher dimension. Mm. That the higher dimension is more difficult to perceive, but it doesn't mean it's not there. Mm. It doesn't mean it's not patterned. It is patterned. So what he did is he basically gave this potentiality of this higher knowledge, which is about the throat chakra activation for Earth and where we are as a world right now, and he was trying to teach us this through all of his paintings. He went to Egypt. He went to the Egyptian mystery schools. Mm -hmm. He was there from 1482 until 1486. Mm -hmm. um, and he was working for Sultan Kate Bay. Da Vinci's mother was a slave that was from Circassia. She was Circassian. And, and so were the Mamluk sultans. The Mamluk sultan, Sultan Kate Bay, was Circassian as well. And these people were in control of the whole area that was called the kingdom. You know, he was the Sultan of Babylon. Mm. Babylon was the original name of the Cairo area. Mm -hmm. So old Cairo today is still called Babylon. Mm. That's where, did you see the article where the two girls solved the um, Pythagoras theorem? Yes. Uh-huh. Yeah. I did. I and saw And then the they just discovered that the, 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 uh, the theorem was on the tablets in Babylon a thousand years before Yeah, so Pythagoras. Plimpton, Plimpton 322 is the name of the clay tablet mm. that uh, had the, this Pythagorean theorem on it and the solutions that they were already trying to look for, the knowledge yeah. was already there, mm -hmm. right? Which is fascinating because then you're like, well, why didn't, why couldn't we figure this out, right? Mathematics and higher dimensional mathematics is all about your perspective. Mm. So I can draw mathematically, I can draw a perspective drawing that will give you the illusion and I could do it so well if I follow the principles of it absolutely correctly to the T. In linear perspective, I could draw uh, and paint a painting here that would look entirely like it's fully three-dimensional, even though it's flat, mm -hmm. right? I can create an illusion and you could create a, a, a whole virtual reality world if that's what's happening right now with spatial computing. Now, yeah. I, I just bought the iPhone 15 as well and that has this spatial camera on it. So mm -hmm. I could shoot this room and see this depth perception and everything and then put my goggles on and look at the photograph and be immersed inside of it. Mm -hmm. And you'd be sitting there and it's all three-dimensional. It's mm -hmm. trippy. Yeah, that means we literally have entered a new dimension because man will not experience things anymore just three-dimensional. That's right. 
So now it's in motion. Mm -hmm. It's got all these other aspects. And so if space can, if that can happen with space, why couldn't it also happen with time? Mm. So that starts to raise some really profound questions about what is time and what's our experience with time, mm. right? And if you look at the opposite of time, so what's the animus of time, mm. right? It would be the same word backwards. So what's time backwards? Emit. And what do we speak of when we say the word emission? Light. So time is directly related to gravity. Mm. We have mass time dilation that relates directly to, you can't separate gravity from time. And the same word written backwards is a reference to emission of light, mm. which is the opposite of time and gravity. Huh. Seems like yet another encryption hidden in plain sight. Mm. Things that are hidden, like Leonardo da Vinci, were not hidden so they couldn't be found. They're hidden so they could be found. Yeah, it's for the seekers. Exactly. It's for the people, like you said, it's not for everyone. For the people that actually go about this effort, understand that they're in this game. The Hindus believe. We live in this world of samsara, right? This world of, mm -hmm. of duality, the plane of the duat. Osiris is stuck in the plane of the duat and having to experience life through reincarnation over and over and over again, suffering and difficulty. And we think that we're in some sort of escape room. What da Vinci is trying to teach us is that when we start to change our perspective, if you want to change your world, change your perspective on that world. Mm. You will change entirely your experience when you do. Be the change you want to see in the world. What he's trying to teach us through all of his paintings and drawings, the big aha of all of it is that you are divine. Mm. You can ascend. You're a player in this game. And the game is actually meant to be fun. And it's not meant for you to want to escape it. In fact, the only way you can transcend it is by falling in love with it just as it is. Mm. Ascension protocol. Information is everywhere. You can log into YouTube right now and type in almost any subject. But I'm going to be honest with you, you won't even know if it's human generated or if it's just based on the algorithm that figured out that you wanted to find this subject and queried your information, created an automated process so they can get your eyeballs to try to sell you a product or get advertisement dollars. Humans need humans. We don't work and operate that well learning from machines because it's the connection to the information, it's the connection to the process that allows us to grow our neurons. It's that connection that allows us to be able to tap into that tapestry of thought to where we need to learn and be in environments to where we feel aspirational and we are inspired and it's empathetic. So today it's not about just having access to the information. It's not just about being able to have democratized education everywhere. It's about connection. Are you actually connected to it? When you are in a community, it reinforces that environment of connection. And that's why being a part of high level looks so important. So you are reinforcing an environment with that human connection. I see you, you see me, you feel felt, you want to learn. Information and data, statistics and numbers and automation is fine, especially if you want to create income and utilize the technology for such. But human connection has always been a real source of learning. Source of Don't learning. just go for the information. Go for the community and go for the connection. We see you at, 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 we see you at. Tap in with the God. When you talk about art, right, because in art and architecture, right, of course it's math. But the beauty of art, right? We have a world now where we create things plain, right? Design and beauty is left out of the design process now mm -hmm. because everything is now almost being designed by computers, right? It's not to stimulate man with the sublime so that he can think of ascension, yeah. right? Or a higher evolution, his mm -hmm. zenith. Mm -hmm. Now things are mechanisms of control. They're all squared, mm -hmm. right? And so when we live in this square reality, it keeps you in this box. But if you look at somebody like Gauti, he was an architecture that designed with nature because he believed that nature doesn't design in straight lines. And it doesn't, right? Nature designs with flow and process. But when now we don't create these sublime, beautiful things, man doesn't think about ascension at all, right? Down to the way our doorknobs look, down to the way the logos look, the stores look, the buildings. You have to look at the past to see beauty, right? You go to somebody like, let's say you go to uh, Paris, right? Yeah. It's a relic of ancient Great Britain. When they design things, mm -hmm. grand scale, when you go, the beauty about 
Egypt and the pyramids is it represents a time where man was climbing the scales of ascension. Yeah, that's utilizing the, the laws of the of universe. What it means to be human. But now we think about where will the next futuristic civilizations be, right? The futuristic cities. It don't look like America because America doesn't even have the ability to scale technology because we have so many infrastructure problems. And because America is so based on capital, right, and how much energy that they can drain out someone, right, based on the systems that we have, which capitalism is fine, especially if you're a conscious capitalist. But the reality of it is, is we're not scaling anything for beauty because we don't care about the man, the end user, right? You go to Dubai, they need to attract. They need to have you thinking about the future. So they're creating grand scale, right? They, they grab all the architectures of the world to attract the beauty of the mind. And when you go out there, you in marvel, right? You looking at it and it makes you think that you can be more. We don't, in America, they don't want us to be more because your more looks like you may take over. No, we need you to be under a system. And as long as we want to be more, that's fine. <laughs> but you need to be in control. You don't tell your, your employees to come here, wear whatever the uniform you want to, and always think about the day you're going to leave this job. <laughs> well, I mean, think about it. It's like, how could we... Up until 19, I think it was 1913, mm. we had no income tax. Yeah. Imagine that for a moment. So all the taxes were on products, goods, and services. You know, it would be like a sales taxes type of thing or tariffs on mm. products being imported into the country. And now we have tax on top of tax on top of tax. Here in California, I'm paying 60% tax. Yeah. I mean, it's everywhere. Why is it so inefficient? Because it's corrupt. It's super corrupt. And it's time to be honest about this. Mm. We have this dilapidated infrastructure system. I've been to Dubai 10 times. I've hung out with, you know, a few of the sheikhs there. So you think, all right, what's it going to be like to go there? So there's some things that are kind of bizarre. You know, WhatsApp doesn't work so well there because they don't like encrypted messaging, right? So they like to be able to see everybody's stuff. So there's some things like that. But in general, these seven sheikhs were able to get together, agree on things, right? And create something, which by the way, has no tax. So it's a tax-free zone. So I've come to the realization now, it's like, if you want to have a truly modernized city, declare no tax, mm -hmm. invite business in, right? Have a philosophy of wanting to attract the right types of, you know, people that match your culture and everything else. I think it's less than 7% of the population in Dubai is actually from Dubai. Mm -hmm. They're all very wealthy. You can yeah. see them all because they're all wearing the white, yeah. right? The, 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 the whole. The thobes and things of that exactly. nature. Exactly. And they've learned how to figure this out. And it, you go to the airport there, you land the first thing, or whether you're in Doha as well, I was there just a few weeks ago. These are some of the nicest airports in the world. Mm -hmm. They're infrastructure. Look at LAX. What a joke. LAX should just be torn down. Yeah. We're like trying to put band-aids on top of band-aids on top of band-aids. It's a, it's a yeah. shit show. We don't realize we live in, in the past. And we're when living I say in that, the past. We're living. Man, you, you go outside America and you see the future. The technology there, you know, I just let the CES show and I was just looking at all the technologies that we have. Some of the best like medical technologies coming out of a city you never heard of in South Korea. Yeah. But they can't even bring that medical technology over here because of our Too laws and issues FDA. and problems. Too difficult. So it's like Americans, the, even the things that we ask from our politicians are wrong, right? We don't even know what to ask because we don't even know it exists. So when we live in, in a world that is outdated and in the past, and, uh, and the average citizen doesn't know to ask for better medical institution and technology that we should have in these hospitals versus just asking for more money from healthcare. No, you need a complete revamping of the healthcare system and the medical technology utilized within that system. So we're even having our ask is even old because it's based on old problems, not current new resources and technology. Have you heard of these things called med beds? Uh, yeah. Yeah. So that is trending. You know, and I grew up, I, I, of course, I see I watched Stargate and like Star Wars and Star Trek and all mm -hmm. of that. So, yeah. They had these like med beds where you sit there in the stasis. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And it scans you. And it's been going crazy on TikTok. Now, some people, it's funny because some people, of course, don't believe in it. Right. And then other people is like, even if it's, you know, based on a belief system, as long as it works, then that's all that matters. 
But the idea of some of these systems, of course, is this scanning your body and your mm-hmm. light field and mm-hmm. trying to rebalance, mm-hmm. right, your system. Yeah, I just did one at, on New Year's. Okay, how was it? Pretty epic. Yeah. Yeah, I was at a, at a New Year's Eve party and the, the guy who owned the technology was, you know, happened to be a lover of math, happened mm-hmm. to be one of my followers. So he's like, oh, you got to go in there and you lay inside this, yeah. this light bed for like 26 minutes, I think mm-hmm. is what it was. And- it was pretty cool. Yeah. I have to say, I really, I really liked it. I did feel something different. And then after that, I had um, some other treatments that, that were there at that same party. It was not, this is not a party where people were drinking and partying. Okay. Well, <laughs> this was like, a, this was like, I was like. Different oh, man, circles, man. Different, they had different man circles. at the party. <laughs> yeah, it was pretty, it was pretty cool. Yeah. So I, I experienced this and I think you're right. Our whole way of looking at healthcare, we are not a true healthcare system. We are a sick care system. Mm-hmm. And, and this is only ever going to be treating symptoms mm-hmm. rather than syndromes. Yeah. Right. And what we're actually dealing with that causes the root cause of sickness, the root cause of sickness, our body is a geometric and light field, mm-hmm. which basically is like a musical instrument mm-hmm. that needs to be tuned. Mm-hmm. There are new technologies that are coming out right now. Sound-based technologies are becoming more and more. Scalar wave technologies mm-hmm. um, are becoming more and more prevalent. Mm-hmm. As I kind of look at this, our entire system right now, you know, I was, I was involved, I was asked by one of the parties to run for U.S. Senate. Mm. And I said, okay, let me, let me see what it's like to be on a campaign team. I did two, three major campaign teams, and I said, I want nothing to do with this. I want nothing to do with it. Why not? Because it was entirely corrupt. I, you should have known that already. <laughs> I knew it already, but what I saw was each of these candidates were already quite wealthy. Mm-hmm. They had the wherewithal to say no mm-hmm. to the party and tell them where to shove it if it didn't go how they wanted it to go. But they got pressured and they didn't know any better and they fell victim to that scenario, which ultimately ended up in them losing their campaigns anyway. Mm. But the point being was I looked at it, I was like, this is just not, you cannot have a big impact with the system the way that it is right now. I think the system has is to be entirely completely broken. redesigned. It needs to be entirely redesigned. And, and I think all the structures in society that try to tell us what's good and evil, what's, what's light and dark, what's right and wrong, what's truth and what's not truth, they're all inevitably self-interested. A hundred percent. Listen, I don't listen to people when they tell me about politics because number one, I already know you either in their interest, right? Or when I think about the system, I know it doesn't work. And the only thing that people keep telling me is keep using the system. If it's broken, it don't matter how much I use, I'm going to get the same results, right? Even if you make a little progress over here, it counterbalances it with you know, what other negative thing that has now just grown even more massive than whatever solution you've gained. Right. And the system is meant to maintain itself. Right. If it had these things built into it where you can just revamp, revolutionize and change it, it wouldn't be the system that it is today. So the the system has been perfectly designed in a way to where it maintains the same exact order. Yeah, it's it's good for iterative change, but it's not good for transformative change. No. And I want transformative change. I don't want to just you just tell me something that's changed and. You know, we get these goddamn symbols of change, but no substance behind it. So I don't believe in the sucker's game. You feel me? You're not going to get me like that. I was always taught do for self. Do you ever read Atlas Shrugged? No, I haven't. So Atlas Shrugged by Ayn Rand, uh, worth reading. Mm. Definitely worth reading. So it's a story about this society that falls down, right? Completely crashes. Yeah. And the reason it crashes is because entitlement rolls in. All of the aspects of society that will create corrosion, the success the, you know, that leads to co- corrosion of society. Mm-hmm. And so this group of people say, screw this, we're going to go and set up our own thing. So they go out in the middle of Colorado, in the middle of nowhere. Mm-hmm. They set up their own society, and all of a sudden they're industrious, they're successful, right? They have their own economic system. They have their own thing. I think we're on that level right now. 2024 is going to bring that level of change Mm. where people are going to start opting out entirely of the current paradigm because a, they're probably not going to be left with much choice. I I don't know if you saw the film on Netflix, which was leave the world behind. Yeah. I love that. Which is like, 
whoa, that was trippy, right? But the thing is, is that we're kind of in that precipice of change moment where it's like, it reminds me of a quote. If there were any one period in time one would desire to be born in, is it not the age of revolution? When old and new stand side by side and admit of being compared, when the energies of all men are searched by fear and by hope, and when the historic glories of the old can be compensated by the rich possibilities of the new era, this time, like all times, is a very good one, if we but know what to do with it. Mm. Ralph Waldo Emerson wrote that. This is the moment that we're in right now. We are in a moment of time where we're actually given a huge mirror to look at ourselves and say, what is it we want? It's kind of like what you said. Life doesn't begin until you get beyond that survival mode, mm -hmm. right? And then when we're faced, you know, my father always said to me, he's like, son, nothing in this world is free, not even freedom. Hell no. Not even freedom. You gotta pay a price. You gotta pay a price for that freedom. You know, the thing about it is once people know the price, most people don't want to pay it. Th that's exactly right. And freedom, people have an idea of what freedom is. And when you actually experience it and somebody tell you, you know, what well, to be free is to be on your own. And most people don't want it because they realize that, you know, master gives you certain benefits to stay in this house. Right. But when he says go out on your own, now you have to fend for yourself in every single way. And every human being is not a great steward of self. Right. So some people do a terrible job when it comes to self-management. So this is why we have these hierarchical systems as well is because some people need to be managed in order for them to live a great quality of life because left up to their own vices, right? Some people self-employed or self-destruct. So freedom is a responsibility that most are not willing to take or pay the price in order to be free. And the utopian idea of freedom is not the reality of it. You know what I'm saying? So freedom has dirty consequences. And you have to then fend for yourself completely. Let me throw you into a sovereign jungle and say, hey, you are free. But now that electricity, the water, the laws, right, the order that you did have amongst the reality in which you called your slavery or with savagery, whatever it was that made you want to defect or opt out or leave. Mm -hmm. Now you got to go build that for yourself. And see, the beautiful thing about the time we're living in, there's enough righteous people who want to be free. That can build new worlds for those who want to be free as well. And that's what I'm talking about. I think there's going to be a dramatic shift coming. You know, we're going to start seeing the major aspects of it mm. this year. Yeah. I really, truly believe that. And, and I'm excited about what it can mean for the future. And I, I think that this whole world of separation, us against them, the notion that it's not about angels, but angles, mm -hmm. and really men speak of you know, moral principle, yet act on power principle. The notion that you start realizing stuff like why these wars are actually happening. Why, if you followed the government, you would have actually gotten 12 booster shots by now. <laughs> are you f kidding me? So I take it you ain't get your boosters. No, hell no. <laughs> oh, hell no. <laughs> no, I mean, now we can start talking about the letter G. Ooh. Ooh, yeah. All right. So here's, here's the question that begins with the letter G. This is from my brother, Blue Pill. My He's, brother, Blue Pill. Yes. I like that. He says. Who's Red Pill? Red Pill is his brother. Actually. Oh, okay. Yeah. So <laughs> there's Blue sense. Pill and Red okay. Pill. That's good. Actually, I'm going to put you on his, his, his content. You're going to love yep, it. Yep. I'm going to love it. So he asks, does the G and Mason stand for geometry or God? You know, this is one of those things. I was just recently, uh, I did a podcast for the Free Your Voice podcast, which was the first podcast that they did. And it happened to be at the House of the Temple in Washington, D.C. Mm. So this is the Freemasonic, you mm -hmm. know, temple that's there. And this place was epic. Yeah. Uh, I couldn't believe, you know, a lot of people think that occult wisdom stuff is meant to be hidden to keep people out. Mm. Right. So they get really negative on it. I'm not a Freemason. I'll say this right now. I'm not a Freemason. I'm not Illuminati. I'm not a member of any <laughs> of these things. Right. I'm not. But at the same time. What would you say if you were? Yeah. <laughs> I would just go. <laughs> but, but the truth is, I'm, I'm not. But okay. I went to this. I was 
eager because yeah. a lot of the work that I've done does point back to Freemasonry. Mm -hmm. I mean, look, they've got a lot of geometric study, and I think the old Freemasonry, uh, Rosicrucianism, et cetera, which then kind of branched into mm -hmm. a lot of different things and, and from Knights Templar, I think it actually had a lot of these incredible principles and wisdom teachings embedded within it. You know, you look at the 47th problem of Euclid, mm. right? These were all things that Freemasons to go up their ladder mm -hmm. of their degrees, which represent the 33rd vertebrae mm -hmm. of the spine, yeah, right? 30 degrees of knowledge. That's right. So the 33 degrees, then this knowledge and wisdom is hidden everywhere. You literally find it everywhere. So is it evil? No, I don't think it's evil. I don't think it's evil at all. I think all of it is encrypted and hidden so that it can be found mm. by the right people. It's the wisdom and knowledge that some things are not meant for everyone to learn based on where they are in their stage of their progression. Mm. And this is very tightly guarded. So you could say Pythagoras might have been one of the first Freemasons, mm. right? Because his Pythagorean cult was meant to protect this wisdom and knowledge so that it wouldn't be bastardized, so it wouldn't be lost. You know, you don't cast your pearls before swine. Mm. And this was the, the general knowledge of it. But what you find when you go into this Masonic temple is you see a lot of quotes that you would know, like, know thyself. There's a chair right outside the main, you know, hall, the major hall that says, know thyself. Of course, that's a quote by Socrates. Uh, two of the most, you know, they simple words, but they... It may sound simple, but it's not easy to know yourself. Mm -hmm. This pursuit of knowledge of self is what, you know, yogis... That's the great and, conquest. That's the great conquest. Because if you think you can or you think you can't, you'll be right. Mm -hmm. And if you can start to master this notion that you are not only an actor on someone else's stage, but actually the script writer. Mm -hmm. So you're the playwright, you're the director, the producer, and the actor, all wrapped in one then you can actually start to live your life in accordance with where you want to be and what you want to do. That's also in accordance with your dharmic path. Right? What is your life destiny? You know, you have a dharmic path that clearly is tied to this, you know, this notion of being a trumpet to the world mm -hmm. around, right? And, and sharing your wisdom and knowledge to the world around you. That obviously has a deep resonance for you, mm -hmm. you know, and it tied to your, your name as well. What is dharmic? Me, I'm not dharma, karmic. dharma, dharma, dharma. Okay. Yeah, like dharma. Like my dharma would be like, what is my destined path? Okay, right. And I believe that what we call destiny is actually just the free will of our God self or our higher self that operates outside of time. That we choose it all. We choose every experience that we wanted to have. Is it like the we wanted predictable to path of who you chosen to become? Yeah, because. It's going to ripple into a pattern, then an ultimate consequence. Yeah. And Everything becomes retrocausal. We, we, we have an easy time understanding that the future is determined by the past, but mm -hmm. we have a hard time understanding that maybe the past is determined also by the future equally. Mm. But in physics, it has to go both ways. It has to. You have an electron that comes from the past spiraling towards the future. You have a positron that's its opposite pairing in dark matter or antimatter that's spiraling from the future down to the past, and they meet at the moment of now. Mm -hmm. And that has a gamma photon annihilation that we call now in this moment of observation we're experiencing. We're never in the future and we're never in the past. We're only in the now. Mm. Even if we were to travel into the future, we'd still be in the now because whatever you're experiencing at that moment is now. The rest is all hypothetical. I think that was a question that they asked. It was supposedly, I think, thought. Mm -hmm. In the movie uh, Gods of Egypt, when he asked him, uh, um, he had to, one of the guys asked him a question, and it was something about what is that has never existed, but is certainty that will exist, something like that, right? And the answer was tomorrow, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Tomorrow will be, but it doesn't exist. <laughs> Right. And it's one of those things is that's why I don't live for tomorrow, because it's not even a reality. There's only a now. Now, I do want to put this as we talking about secrets to be unfold in the number 19. So I'll give you another one. Mm -hmm. So I do believe, though, that G is geometry. 
Okay. Yeah. And that geometry shows the wisdom of the creator, God. Mm. So it could be used synonymously with the word God. That was the same conclusion that he believed. So, and it's funny because I want to go into something that Hitler was obsessed with the Masons as well. Mm -hmm. Right. And that part is not really talked about by a lot of people. He took a lot of their books. Right. And he studied a lot of their information because he believed that their ability to like set up systems and have power and influence was incredible. He believed basically they had magic. Right. So he studied all of their systems and applied it. And then so calledly those get those books were given back. But Russia took some of those books as well with them and never gave them back. Yeah. I mean, I think. You could say that Freemasons, and in and, and the Freemason temple, there's a library. Mm. And the library is full of books about Pythagoras, mm -hmm. full of books about Euclid, about all these mathematicians. Uh, it's also full of all the esoteric wisdom books you could ever imagine, right? Mm -hmm. Manly P. Hall and many others. The point being that they had a pursuit, and it doesn't matter, on the temple altar in the House of the Temple in Washington, D.C., are five books. The five books are the Holy Bible, mm. the Quran, right? At least the ones that were in there. Mm -hmm. um, there is a, a book about self realization and, and like Yogananda, mm -hmm. right? Which is like autobiography of a yogi. Um, there is also the Talmud and Torah as a combination. You could say that's partially related to the Bible, but it is still different. And they don't care that you believe which path you believe in God. What they, what at least they purport to, to believe, is that you have to have some concept of a higher, mm -hmm. you know, omniscient, omnipotent, or uh, architect being, right? And the understanding of that, because it's fundamental, but you could go down the Quran path, you could go down any one of the other paths, and they don't, they don't care at all. You just can't be a non-believer in mm -hmm. a higher architect. Yeah. And... Anyone can go inside this temple. It's not like it's close to the public. Anyone can go in there. You can find, you can check out as many books as you want. You can spend all freaking day there if you want. I believe that the whole thing is literally about for people that want to seek higher knowledge and wisdom. I have not chosen that because I have chosen to do that on my own mm. as an autodidact mm. to study those things. I've probably studied many of the same things mm -hmm. and gone through the geometric aspects because as you draw geometry, to me, that's my most loved method of meditation is to draw geometry because it brings me closer and closer to the OG, right? Mm. Which is, which is, you know, God himself, herself. It's, and it's not masculine or feminine. It is something that is both. It's not light or dark. It's both. When it was October 16, 1995, mm -hmm. um, at the Million Man March. Okay. Right. So again, that six is an upside down nine. Mm -hmm. and, and my conquest um, and search and studying of the number 19, I found this speech that was very significant. Okay. And it was in the background, it was Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan. And at the Million Man March, of course, it was the largest yeah, I remember gathering. It. I remember it. Right? Mm -hmm. right there on those steps. And the and, Washington Mall. Mm -hmm. And the Washington Mall. And he said, in the background is the Jefferson and Lincoln Memorials. Each one of those monuments are 19 feet high. Um, and he said, Abraham Lincoln is the 16th president and Thomas Jefferson is the third president, mm -hmm. right? And 16 and three, of course, make 19 again. He said, what is so deep about the number 19? Why are you standing on the Capitol steps today? He said, that number 19, when you have that nine, you have a womb that is pregnant. And when you have a one standing by the nine, that means that there's some a secret that has to unfold, right? It has to be brought in. The secret that was unfold is that the slaves used to be brought here on this mall in chains. Right along this mall, going over to the White House, our fathers were sold into slavery. And then he goes on to give the true date of when slavery had began in this country. And it wasn't 1619, where they said they brought over 16 or 19 people. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But he was giving a breakdown about one of the, uh, and he said that this is one of the Masonic secrets, right? Is that the secret of America is being black bodies, right? And it has always powered America, right? That one and that nine for me has always been this understanding of, you know, seeing my reflection and 
understanding that part of being that trumpet bringer is to speak that truth. Right. And it is the unveiling of some of the secrets, because mm -hmm. for some of the secrets, it allows us to move forward. Once you know that you are the source code, right, that powers up something, you can then decide to empower yourself. Right. And throughout time, whether you're looking at, you know, out in India, right, or you look at Apis or the black bull or the mother of the bull, mother of the bull, that That's statue. Right. Mm -hmm. With the erect God and the fist up is a representation of fecundity of the mind and the body, mm -hmm. right? The, you know, when we talk about like thought or we talk about, you know, um, uh, Imhotep, right? Or we talk about the um, reasons why history is skewed throughout mm -hmm. the world. Mm -hmm. It's because, like, as you talked about before, you know, a lot of them did not want that representation of intellect in connection to that black body. The black body was always looked at or not always looked at, but white supremacy pushed the narrative mm -hmm. that the darker races were inferior and the lighter were superior and the advances of civilization were connected to the lightning of the world, mm -hmm. not the origin of the dark. Yeah. Right. So part of that 19 is that level of self-awareness about the history of the planet Earth at the same time, because then that corrects the self-image that we have, right? That self-image that we have about who we are is corrected. And then that hologram that we reflect on the inside can be reflected on the outside. So when I think about the design of reality, I often think about, you know, you know, they say, uh, as if you are a God, you're going to create things in your image. They say we are created in the image of God, right? Which means that his signature is upon us, right? But what is the righteous signature of man? You talk about the codexes that you find in mm -hmm. the paintings and mm -hmm. the different ancient places. But what is the code that modern man will leave behind that represents a righteous reflection for another generation to then look upon and say, yo, that generation was enlightened. That generation went through dark ages, went through a stage of correction. And now the seekers in the future can go through that same human evolution, because no matter how fast technology becomes, it does not represent the evolution of man. It represents the evolution of external realities, but man is his internal reality, right? Your spark of consciousness, your understanding of symbols and knowledge, your expansiveness based on your exposure and your curiosities towards knowledge and light. That's the true living right there. When man is able to find pleasures and the wonders of the world in creation, right? versus the overindulgence in the things and the vices that they give us, then you really live in the rest is just distractions to keep you from ever being one who becomes laser focused. You know, it, it's really interesting you say that. I people get so fascinated with the notion of dying. Mm. So it's like, oh, first thing you want to know is you you may not ask it because it's like kind of inappropriate sometimes. You're mm. like, but how did he die? Mm. Right. We get so fascinated That's a fact. with how someone died that we forget to ask the question of how he yeah. lived. Mm. And every man dies, but not everybody lives. A fact. So I think that the thing that I hope, you know, and I think what happens is we hate each other. We hate, hate ourselves. Therefore, because we hate ourselves, we end up hating each other. Mm. It all starts with our own self-hatred and self-loathing. That's what narcissism is. Narcissism is true self-loathing. Mm. You only want to see the aspect of yourself that you want to see, and that's the only part you love, but the rest you don't like at all, and you don't even want it to exist. So you push it out of you so much so that you disidentify with it, and then you deflect onto other people. Mm. So the person who claims that everyone else around them is arrogant is actually the arrogant person themselves, mm. because a truly humble person cannot perceive arrogance. He will see humility around him. She will see humility around her. This is a different way of looking at the world. So, but what happens is we start to hate ourselves so much and we become a little bit aware. And so when we become a little bit aware, we go through this alchemical process, which is called negredo, starts with the blackening. Then it goes to the albedo, which is the whitening. This is the process of coming into contact with your anima and animus, starting to learn your shadow. So looking at Carl Jung, and psychology, right? Well, you get to this albi al albedo stage, which is the swan. It's represented by the swan. The first is represented by 
uh, the Negredo is represented by black crows. So you mm. start seeing black crows everywhere. This is alchemical teachings. Well, people often think that they become enlightened when they get to the albedo. So they're representing by the swan. So they think, okay, I'm becoming enlightened. But they're still not quite there yet because often they're still carrying the judgments of others and themselves along with them. Anyone that claims to be awakened, and I'm purposely not saying the word woke, <laughs> right? Anyone that claims to be awakened and judges others is not is only somewhere in the gradation of process going towards the true awakening. Because once you're fully awakened, you realize that there's no one else to blame but you. So there's an ancient Chinese proverb, which goes like this. The man who blames others, right? The man who blames others is, uh, is, has a long way to go in his journey. The man who blames himself is only halfway there. The man who blames no one has already arrived. Mm. So the man who blames others has a long way in his journey to go towards enlightenment. The man who blames himself is only halfway arrived. The man who blames no one has already arrived. This knowledge that we don't need to be so hard on ourselves, that by changing how we look at ourselves, it will change how the world around us is and acts. And we start to realize that the hurt of any one man outside of us in this you inverse that we live in, because it's literally a reflection of what's happening inside of you, the hurt of any one man or hurt of any one woman is the hurt of all. That is a legacy and a shift in human consciousness that I hope that we can leave behind. Absolutely. You have to be connected to a higher nature in order to have that level of empathy. Because then what could happen is that man can destroy the world. All men can destroy the world, mm -hmm. right? And when you have this change in consciousness that I don't no longer want to destroy the world, but the world is destroyed. Now, the people who are in the undercurrent of your wrath of destruction, maybe they don't blame you, right? Maybe you don't blame yourself. But where is the benefit if it's already lopsided, right? And in order to create the, you know, the ma'at, the truth, order, and justice, because it's really about balancing the scales. Yeah. Right, the heart and the feathers, the sins of man, right? Mm -hmm. So when we think about the collectiveness of reality and us getting to a story where we have balance, it has to be led with truth, right? Truth is just shining light where it's dark, right? And when we are ignorant of something, even when we think we know, we have this artificial light in our head. It's not the real truth, right? And I think that what it does is I think replacing the word blame with, you know, uh, accountability. Yeah. Right. I think that's where with we start doing these like perspective shifts because it's not so much as a pointing of the finger. Right. But it's a recognizing that if you don't have atonement within self, even if I had atonement within myself, then there's no balance. And what's atonement at one minute? Mm hmm. And, and, and that's coming to peace with. Self and decision. It's becoming holy in the context of being whole, mm. right? So it starts to change our context of what is holiness. Mm. It means to be whole. Mm. You know, I'm not afraid of the people that know they have a dark aspect that, you know, they may not like themselves. Yeah. I'm more afraid of the people that believe they have none and they believe they're only righteous. Mm. They're not holy. They're not made whole. Everything Da Vinci has tried to teach us, and I've learned the wisdom from it, has been to embrace the wholeness of me, the full aspect of me. The more I learn to embrace and love myself fully, the more I love the, le the world around me, my you inverse, and I realize that I can transcend through that love. It's like the moment that the power of love exceeds the love of power. When the power of love exceeds, truly exceeds the love of power, then you know the world has shifted. And that's the stage that we're now starting to become aware of at least, right? And I believe that enlightenment is when 
your expression of love it supersedes and exceeds your desire for one objective truth. Isn't it in that moment, you probably had relationships, right? I'm, I'm guessing you've had relationships, some that worked and some that worked for longer times and some that you mm-hmm. know, haven't worked as well. We all have, right? I've been through three marriages, so <laughs> I'm not giving any marital you definitely advice. Have. Yo, <laughs> I'm not in any position to give any advice in that regard. But what I'll say is this. I learned earlier on that there comes a time in a relationship when I had to realize that the relationship existence, the existence of that relationship was more valuable to, to me than being right. Because we all inevitably get into this moment of like, no, I'm right. No, I'm right. No, I'm right. I'm right. I'm right. And you're arguing over things like a cylinder versus a rectangle in a circle mm-hmm. when actually it's a cylinder. So. What I realized was that in order to make my relationships last longer and work, I had to finally just say, you know what? It's not important to me who's right or wrong. Our relationship's more important and supersedes that because I love you. That's the point where humanity is going to have a dramatic shift. When we finally decide that it doesn't matter who's right or wrong. Oh, well, we sound, we sound, we sound very far off. <laughs> We, we sound, sound very, very far, far off. off until a new age comes about, a new we're, age that spreads um, over the consciousness of man and, and proceeds are about, over the affairs of man. Out there. The fact that you and I are sitting here having this conversation right now is a sign of that time coming. I 100% agree. I agree to that. Right? 30 years ago, we wouldn't be doing this. Mm-mm. You couldn't make a living pontificating right, and having conversations about philosophy and yet today, I know lots of people that are making a living talking about philosophy mm-hmm. by any other word. Well, unless you was an author or a professor. Yes, but, <laughs> but now it's been decentralized. Yes, that's the, but that's the beauty of it is that this is the, the natural order of breaking down of systems, right? And it's kind of like not by force, but by flow, because the world has to expand and grow and expire certain things. And when those things expire, new things pop up. People aren't watching the narratives anymore. Well, I mean, people they're watching look for the podcast. fall of things and not the They're not watching the rise. Mine, right? They're watching. I've, you know, I did a podcast yesterday or two days ago that all of a sudden, you know, it's gotten tons and tons of views in mm-hmm. just two days. What was it about? Uh, recent discoveries in Egypt. Okay. Recent discoveries in Egypt. And, you know, I, I actually showed fix, pictures and everything. I had it all on computer. But the, the point being that this type of thing would have never happened. I mean, the number of people that watch CNN every day is like maybe in the low millions or Mm -hmm. high hundreds of thousands. It used to be the thing everybody watched. People are seeking light now. People are seeking, it's like the anti, the Mm anti-villain. And and it's anti-establishment. You are both a spiritualist and a mathematician and Mm -hmm. a scientist, Mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Most scientists aren't Mm -hmm. spiritual, Mm -hmm. right? So how do you differentiate or how do you look at, you know, the occult sciences, right? Which has to add in belief and spirituality within it. And how do you regulate that with the scientists like Eric Weinstein, who may look at yours as differential? I have a funny story. Do you know Matthias DiStefano? Mm -mm. Matthias has a show on Gaia and he... uh, He has memories of his lifetimes in Atlantis, Mm. right? So he's got a lot of followers on this. Memories of his lifetime in Atlantis. That's right. So now you can basically reach out. He's a good friend. I can connect you guys if you want to do a thing with him. He's got a lot of followers, and he came with me to Egypt on the last trip. You can ask Billy about it. Billy knows him well, too. The point is that Matthias was with me having breakfast, and Eric Weinstein came Mm -hmm. to the breakfast. So and we had a fourth friend, uh, Justin Resvani, who is a, a mutual friend. And uh, Justin had told, uh, Justin's a DJ as well, and he had told Eric the night before, we were all in Miami, in Bitcoin Miami. I'd never met Matthias in this way. I, I had met him once before, that's not true, at Aubrey's thing, but at Arcadia. But we're sitting there, and all of a sudden, Eric Weinstein walks up. He's like, Robert, I've been wanting to you know, connect with you. Because he's been following me, I follow him, and yeah. he's been following me for like four or five years or something. And he likes you know my geometry work, even though I'm on more of the esoteric and spiritual side mm-hmm. of stuff, right? So he wanted to talk and meet, and so we did. 
what was supposed to be a one hour breakfast ended up being like five hours. Mm -hmm. Right. And we walked around Miami together and we had a great time. Yeah. But it was funny because he's like, so who's this guy, Matthias? And, and, and so Matthias, very prominent spiritualist, right? And I said, oh, he goes, what th which three-letter agency is Matthias with? And I looked at him and I said, oh, he's with G-O-D. <laughs> so Eric looks at me and goes, I'm not familiar with that agency. <laughs> yeah, see, daddy issues. <laughs> <laughs> and we were laughing so hard on that one. I'm like, yeah, G-O-D, just like, yeah. like actually say the word. I was like, oh, okay. It was really funny. But, you know, I, I think that uh, Eric is a, he's a brilliant guy. There's no doubt about it. And I think he's not wrong on his work in geometry. But if you understand that the universe is based on the principles of geometry, you're literally speaking about the existence of God without saying the word God. Maybe it's daddy issues, right? As you said, now I'm going to call it from, forevermore. Yeah. It's going to be, you got daddy <laughs> issues, right? But, but for sure, when you have that much syntropy, which is the opposite of entropy, mm. it's pattern you simply cannot ignore somebody had to create the pattern. Right. So the way I bring them all together is that I don't see them as separate. I decided to look at the world differently and say, I'm not going to see art, mathematics. I'm not going to see applied math and applied geometry and applied biology and all these different disciplines as being separate, but actually more like a spectrum mm. of color. Mm. It's like the 19 again. I look at 19 and the number one is like, to me, I have synesthesia. So I see colors with numbers. I always okay. have. Yeah. Okay. I do with music too. So I look at the number one and I see like infrared and red, mm -hmm. a mix of infrared and red. And the number nine is ultraviolet. Mm. So you've literally. That's crazy because that's the same color I seen before you said that. So you've literally Both bounded the entire spectrum of visible light, which mm. is a tiny, tiny percentage of it's one octave of experience mm -hmm. in a gigantic full piano, 88 keys or 88 octaves as expansions, right, of electromagnetic spectrum. So we've, we're, we can only see the visible spectrum as only one octave out of this entire piano or one. It's like looking at one key and then splitting up that one key into, you know, 12 different subsets. Mm -hmm. And that's what we call chromatic color or chromatic scale in music, right? So the way I look at it is that all of this other stuff that we don't perceive, that we can't see, we often throw it into this bucket of seeing is believing. But actually, my experience, and as sure as I'm sitting here with you, I've learned that the exact opposite is yeah. in fact the truth. It wouldn't be infrared Light or infrared sound, right? If 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 we think about it, things that's below the the human hearing or things that's beyond the human spectrum of sight, we get stuck with our senses. Human beings start operating within their senses, and they forget that there's more dimensions. And the common man is easy to fool with that. But if you go to people like the Dogon, how did they operate then? Right? See, science always science thinks it knows everything, right? But honestly, science only knows what it knows. Science doesn't know what it doesn't know, right? That's the entropy. And that's it the It doesn't thing. mean it's not patterned. Yeah. At one point in our history, we didn't know that microwaves existed. And then we finally understood that microwaves existed, and we pushed the boundary of our knowledge further out away from us. Mm -hmm. It's like we went from pi being 22 over 7, and then we realized, oh, a closer approximation is 355 over 113. And then there's a whole infinite equation that someone came along with and figured out to solve so that you could have infinite decimal digits of pi to be totally accurate. Mm. Each time we push the boundary out from the first moment that we figured, hey, here's a stick, and is there a relationship between a circle that would go around that stick, a perfect mm. circle, and we find that there might be a relationship. Each time we start to realize that there is a relationship and tethered towards that, we start to expand consciousness. Expanding consciousness is just expanding our knowledge it's bringing light to what was previously dark. It's bringing centropy. It's not that the centropy didn't already exist. It was already there. That's the thrice great principle, connect the human with the divine. So that brings me to the question you have about avoiding the darkness. 
and that's why I really like this movie on Netflix. I really recommend you see it. Um, you know, Orion and the Dark, which is funny because I'm I'm launching right now a, a whole platform in social media, mm. which is the only one that government can't crack. It it has um, it's full quantum secure encrypted, and it's the most powerful encryption in the world. And you you can have a full social media experience it's like Instagram, but it's also a messaging app, mm-hmm. and it's all built into one. I'll get you on it, but. So it's a it's a quantum app, quantum secure app. Yeah. So mm. it means that even quantum computers can't crack it. Definitely had to say something about quantum because I know you did the the book called what's it called Deep Mind or Deepin Deep Mind. Oh, that's another. That's a, that's not me. That's not you. No, that's not me. But I've read the book. I yeah, I read that book. I like it though. Yeah, I thought that yeah. was you. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. You know what? It's funny because in the book. The beginning of the book, it starts off when he was 19 years old and he worked for Obama. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. <laughs> and he said he made Obama's first Facebook page. So I thought that was you because he yeah, had to be no, in technology no, no. too. Deep Mind is, is cool. But, oh, uh, that's funny. That is funny. But <laughs> So here's the, here's the thing, though, about, you know, there is an aspect. And I'll give you, this will be the first. I've not talked about this anywhere. Okay. So I just took uh, 42 influencers to Egypt, and I'm inviting you on my next trip. Mm-hmm. Um, I took 42 influencers with me to Egypt. Uh, Matthias was in that group. Billy Carson was in that group. Do you know Zach Bush? Mm-mm. Zach Bush. Uh, do you know Danica Patrick? I've heard the of race her, car yeah. driver. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Uh, you know, this this was a really epic group of people. Yeah. People that you would definitely like to vibe with, and um, I'll make sure that you come with me on a, on a future trip. But The thing that was interesting about it is we were going to do, and I invited everybody to come do this throat chakra activation. So we went to the Great Pyramid and it was amazing. I mean, we had some of some great singers on that trip as well, like big professional people. And we we had a full on social media blackout on the whole thing. Mm -hmm. And um, and just because, you know, the way you get all these people that are big influencers to like actually enjoy life is to take away their phone and make it forced, right? Because Otherwise, I'll be like always on it type of thing. Well, while we were there uh, at the very end of the week, and we, we spent the beginning of the week at the Great Pyramid, we spent the night, uh, and no one sleeps in the pyramid, by the way. You're, you're there just checking the whole place out the entire time. But I've spent 17 nights in the Great Pyramid. Mm. And this night, we had all three pyramids. And there's incredible stuff that you can learn about. I'd do another podcast with you to, to go through it if, you're, if you re- are interested to learn about what's been discovered inside the pyramids. And what's happening because a new chamber that I predicted on my show, Code X, mm. uh, they, they, they use ground penetrating radar, right? And tomography, it's another word, you know, it's a muon tomography to be able to find empty chambers inside the Great Pyramid that they have not yet discovered. And what I predicted was that the Vitruvian man, when you overlay the Great Pyramid on top of it in the exact right way, shows a map of all the chambers. Mm -hmm. So Da Vinci actually had access to some map. And so as part of my show in the first season, I predicted that the next chamber would be at the throat chakra line because Da Vinci cut his man into 14 lines. So there are 14 lines to represent the cuts of Osiris. Osiris was killed by his brother, Set, and cut into 14 parts, right? So each of these lines represent, the one at the groin represents a subterranean chamber. Mm -hmm. The one at the ground level represents uh, you know, where the, where the navel is, right? And there, there should be a chamber there as well. Uh, the one that's at the solar plexus area of the body is where the queen chamber is. There's one at the chest. There's a, a, a horizontal line that goes right across the chest, and that represents the king's chamber. Then there's one at the throat. There's one at the nose. There's one at the forehead, and then there's one at the top of the head. So, and there's two at the knees as well. And then there's vertical lines at the arms and the shoulders and then the, the wrist and then the elbows. Well, what's interesting about it is that it gives us the exact location for the subterranean chamber, the queen's chamber, the ground level, and the, the king's chamber. But then there are lines for the rest of the pyramid that we don't have any information of. So I predicted that the next place that they would find a chamber would be at the throat chakra line, mm. right? For the throat chakra activation. I believe we live in a simulation. Yeah. And as we ascend to higher knowledge and find these chakras and energy centers within ourselves and fully activate them, then they get found as well in the Great Pyramid, which is kind of a trippy concept. But I'm with it. about I'm a week it. ago, about two weeks ago, I was at Gaia filming my second season on Codex 
a second season. It's called Metatron Revealed. And while we were there, we had lunch. I was like, look, I think they're going to discover this new chamber here pretty soon because they've got more accurate you know, radar systems to be able to see this stuff. And they're going to publish it. So you guys need to be ready because we'd predicted this on the show three years ago. Last week, we were actually made aware of the article that was published in Academia that showed the new ascending chamber that goes above the Grand Gallery. So if you've been to the Great Pyramid, you know there's an ascending chamber. Mm -hmm. It's at a 26-degree angle. And then uh, it takes you to the King's Chamber. There's another one directly above it at the same angle that leads straight to the throat chakra line. And it's exactly where we said it was going to be. Mm. And Jean-Pierre Houdin, a famous archaeologist, uh, architect, and Egyptologist, published this based on the, the latest scans. And it is exactly where the throat chakra line is. So Da Vinci then was not only, I mean, he nailed it, right? Totally correct. But that also begs the question, then what's at the knees deep below the pyramid? And what's above the throat chakra chamber, which is a small cubic style uh, chamber that I believe has only a throne inside of it, like a meta throne. Mm -hmm. The term metatron actually means the throne beyond. Mm -hmm. It's a Greek term. And then above that, there's one that would be at the pineal gland, and there's another that would be at the crown chakra, mm -hmm. right? And so what are all these missing chambers for the lines that are shown on da Vinci's Vitruvium Inn? The most iconic symbology of humanity that probably has ever existed in the last 500 years. It's the most famous image. We think about mankind, we think about this guy standing right here. Well, what's um, fascinating about all of this is that as I looked at the Giza Plateau and found that each one of the pyramids were actually directly related by space on their slope angles to musical intervals. So mm. if you know music, you can split, right? You can split an octave into its middle point, mm -hmm. right? Its middle point. And the way that each note is derived is you take another root of two. So it'd be the one twelfth root of two, the second twelfth root of two, the third twelfth root of two, and you multiply that by your starting frequency. So if your starting frequency is 432 hertz, to find the middle of the scale, you multiply it by the square root of two, which is 1.4142. And we think of the square root of two as being the entity or the, the eternal aspect of duality, right? You take a circle, split it into two halves. You've got a light side, you've got a dark side, you cut it in half. And the square root of two becomes the decompressed form of the number two. So you could say that the number two is a compression for an infinite number. And the concept of infinity with no repeating patterns inside of that 1.4142 goes on forever, right? We tend to think of that as duality. Duality. We don't like duality. Everybody hates duality. Well, as I started looking at the musical note system, it's all based on duality. It's all based on the square root of two because of this first 12 root of two, the second 12 root of two. And as you look beyond this, you start to realize, well, wait a minute. What's going on here? We've got this square root of two. The Great Pyramid has the square root of two embedded within it. It's two over one pi, right? So it's got the square root of two embedded right within it, at, and it's hypotenuse. And then in addition to that, you've got another pyramid, the second pyramid, which happens to be the perfect fifth and the perfect fourth, which would be in music like, Da, 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 so da, da. That relationship of a perfect fifth is directly related to this mathematical ratio, which is three over two. So the second pyramid is giving you a 53.13 degree angle, which gives you exactly this same proportionality that you need mm -hmm. to create that angle. The same is true for the Menkari pyramid. So then what about the rest of the notes? Where are they? So if I've got the first six musical intervals in the first three pyramids, and then the octave double is inside of it, as well as the unison, so I've got eight out of 13 musical notes in a scale. Eight of those notes are occupied just by the Giza Plateau. What about the other notes? Well, guess what? I told you already that Saqqara and the Djoser complex, the Djoser pyramid, is one of those musical intervals as well. So the only ones that are left then because that's two more, so that's 10 out of 13. So what about the other ones? Well, guess what's left? The minor third and the major sixth, it's inverted pairing. I couldn't find it anywhere. Could not find it. So guess what? We found it. 
It's eight kilometers northwest of the Great Pyramid Complex in a place called Abu Rawash. Mm. There were two pyramids there. They both match the philosopher's stone symbology. Have you ever seen the symbology in geometry of philosopher's stone? It's an equilateral triangle mm -hmm. with a square and mm -hmm. then a circle within that, right? And then Michael Meyer drew one that's different. It's a steeper pyramid, much steeper, with a square inside of it and a circle. Those are the two ways to represent these pyramids. Well, guess what? These two pyramids are called the Jed Ephraim pyramids. You've heard of Jed, mm -hmm. right? The Jed, Jedi. Mm -hmm. The Jed. The it's Jed is side. raising the Jed, going up the 33 vertebrae, up the back, right, to the Waz scepter. And you've raised the Jed through this whole alchemical process, which includes the union, marriage of masculine and feminine, the marriage of the Red King and the White Queen. Mm. These two things come together. And when you finally found all of this metaphor is just a metaphor for merger of the left and right hemispheres of the brain through the optic chiasm to find your God self. When the conscious mind merges with the subconscious mind to form a superconscious mind, you start realizing that the world around you is not separate from you. You're no longer blaming anyone. You realize you chose it all and that every experience was exactly as it was intended to be. That you're the playwright, the actor, the director, and the producer. You're the whole thing. And you funded the whole thing too. Mm. With your efforts of having to deal with suffering and difficulty. What we found was that these two pyramids were exactly these proportions. One of the pyramids that has that tighter shape is exactly the one on the end of the ba backside of the dollar bill. So you look at the dollar bill, the proportion of the pyramid on the backside of the dollar bill is exactly the same as the satellite pyramid that was next to mm. this larger pyramid. Now, this complex is 300 feet higher than the Great Pyramid complex. So it looks down on Giza. It's only 8,000 meters away. So you see the pyramids in the background mm -hmm. right there, right? But what's fascinating about this is that it's giving you the missing notes, the missing notes that complete the scale. So it's almost as if Giza and Abu Rawash Plateau are part of the same complex because they follow the same musical convention right, to give us this information. Now, who built this place? There are two pyramids there. They both exploded. They're both made of crystal. Unlike the other pyramids where, you know, we have Menkari that had a base of rose granite. These two pyramids were both made. They had limestone cores, but their outer shell were 100% all rose granite, which is very difficult to get. You have to go all the way to Aswan to get it, mm. right? It's far, far away, mm -hmm. 800 kilometers. So, You've got to bring this rose granite to construct the entire outside of this pyramid. They're sitting on a plateau that's 300 feet higher, and they both have very, very steep slope angles, one of 60 degrees, the other of 67.4 degrees, one on the dollar bill. They're both the Philosopher's Stone pyramids, mm. which represents the Jed, raising of the Jed, and they're even called the Jed pyramids. Now, what's fascinating about this is who built them. Now, I found a map that was from 1457. The map was found uh, you know, first by me in Florence. Have you ever been to Florence before? No. Okay, so there's a, a place called the Galileo Museum. You go to the Galileo Museum, you see a map of the world from 1457. So this is before Christopher Columbus. You look at Egypt, where Egypt exists on the map, and guess how many pyramids there are? You would have thought this guy was an amazing map cartographer mm -hmm. before Columbus he would have got the right number of pyramids. He put five pyramids on there. Not three pyramids of the Giza Plateau, but five. So that stood out to me first and foremost. Secondly, the River Nile was not named the River Nile. It was called Gihon. Gihon is a word that is a reference, for those of you that know the Bible, to the river that gushes out of the Garden of Eden. And it's actually a reference to the Kushite people. The Kushite people being the people that live predominantly in Somalia, in what is you know, present day Eritrea. Uh, you also include Kushite in Sudan as well as Egypt. That whole area around Ethiopia, Sudan, all those countries have the Kushite mm -hmm. right, people. Now, the first reference that we see the Kushite people 
right, is a reference to this because the Gihon is a reference to Cush. It means gushing water. Now, what's interesting about it is we look at the Nile and we say it empties into the Mediterranean and it goes from this Sudan area and comes down. So that's you know, what we would call Upper Egypt down to Lower Egypt, which is where Cairo is. Mm. And then it empties into the Mediterranean. Okay, So the Cushite people were said to have been founded by a man named Cush. What a bizarre thing. The grandson of Noah. So the grandson of Noah was Cush, and he had a son whose name was Nimrod, also known for being the Orion constellation. He was a great hunter. Now, some people thought he was a bad guy. Other people thought he was a great guy. Mm. What he was doing is he wanted to become godlike. He built these two pyramids, or maybe more pyramids that we don't know. Also, he's associated with Enoch, the concept of Enoch. So you have this man who built on a hill a pyramid that looked like it was reaching to the sky. The height of this pyramid, the Jed Pyramid, was 300 feet high on top of the 300 feet that was already higher than the Great Pyramid's elevation level. So the Great Pyramid's height is 481 feet. It was the tallest building in the world for thousands of years. We could debate how many thousands of years, but no question about it, at least for the last 4,500, even mainstream people would say it was the tallest building in the world. Now you've got a pyramid that was 600 feet high. So if you're standing on the Giza Plateau, you would look up at a 60-degree angle of ascent this thing would look like it was reaching into heaven. Mm. And it's made of granite. The whole thing, rose granite. What caused it to explode? The original name of Cairo was Babylon. So now we have the Gihon River and Babylon that was supposed to be founded by Nimrod, the son of Cush. The son of Cush. You have that original river that was supposed to be next to Babylon. How did we end up with Babylon in Mesopotamia? It was never really found. It could have easily been a Neo-Babylon, just like we have New York. I believe the original Babylon was what we think of today as Old Cairo. That's immediately adjacent to the Jed pyramids that were built by the son of Cush, right? who was Enoch, also known as Nimrod, the same as the Orion constellation that we have in the sky. And that what we're looking at here would have been the tallest building in the world around that time of 600 feet high. The other pyramid would have been about 400 feet high based on the elevation. Same as the one on the dollar bill. And these are very steep pyramids. Mm -hmm. I think we're talking about the original Tower of Babel. Mm. And that this was actually a Kushite part of this kingdom. If you look at it, what was it that Josephus, who is a notable historian, and Herodotus, also another Greek historian, they both believed that the Nile River was the Gihon River. So therefore, where was the Garden of Eden? It's hard to know because this is all after the flood, right? If you believe in the historical reference to the flood. I believe that there was floods. There's too many stories of a massive flood Mm -hmm. having occurred Mm. all over the place. I mean, I found petroglyphs on the walls at Philae Temple on an island where the Temple of Isis is in a rooms that you're not allowed to go into that they've since boarded off that we climbed up into among all the bat shit that we found inside there. There were petroglyphs, very detailed, I can show them to you, of whales swimming above high trees. Mm. So clearly some sort of reference to, you know, there was a big flood and there are whales that were swimming above trees, like full trees. I believe that, uh, that the original Garden of Eden was actually related to the Gihon River. The Gihon River had its emanation point coming out of that southern Egypt, Sudan area, right, which is a place called Bir Tawil. It's an area of land that's not currently claimed in the world, strangely mm. enough, because when the English left their occupation, they screwed up so many places. They didn't do the maps right, so then people had all these disputes, and nobody's claimed this land. And it's actually quite large. Is it any useful? It could be. If you looked at Dubai 50 years ago, you might say, is it any useful? That's a good point. I think that the whole history of what we believe 
the human story has been, has been an adulteration and an amalgamation of the story of victors of self-interest. Mm. Well, the victors tell the story. That's how it is, right? The victor To the victor goes the spoils, and the first spoil is to tell the history. I think that the whole story is wrong. And now if you start thinking about this, okay, in the Tower of Babel story, prior to that time, we must have had some form of telepathy to communicate. Mm. Because this is when God apparently confounded the languages and everyone lost their ability to have their language. Well, the Great Pyramid and the two other pyramids on the Giza Plateau represent the vocal cords of the throat chakra. Mm. And now you've got these two pyramids, the steep one, which is a satellite, represents the pineal gland. And the shape of the pineal gland is matching those proportions. It's a 5, 12, 13 right triangle inside of it. And the equilateral triangle is the same as the pituitary gland. This would have been the crown chakra complex, which is supposed to be when you achieve a superconscious mind mm-hmm. evolution. I believe that that's what these Kushite people were actually working towards and what, what Nimrod had actually built. And it was destroyed. You could find the blocks of it hundreds of meters all around. But I think this whole story about where Babylon was mm-hmm. and what it was and what the Tower of Babel was, imagine we had the ability to have telepathy across the board because we had a full activation of the crown chakra. Then you probably would have the ability to have full-on telepathy. I believe that that's possible and most likely true. I got a question for you. What does your cabinet look like? What is it that you're taking into your routine that's keeping you high level? If it's not our products, then whose products are you taking? And if it's no products, then that's a problem. Y'all seen our commercial for Goldwater, right? You've seen it all over high level conversations. You come to the show, you grab your bottle, people give us the best testimonials on the planet, and we got people on the go. The thing about Goldwater is it's not our only product. We have products like the vitamin C moss. We don't naturally produce vitamin C, so we got to get it in other forms. So therefore, especially during wintertime, we are able to keep that immune system functioning high. Let's say if you just want pure moss. This is just pure moss. I'm talking about the superfood, the best on the planet. And not just from anywhere, because you never know when people are actually getting their moss from. I ain't never seen them take a trip to Jamaica. See, we get ours tested, right? To make sure that you're getting the highest quality, pure version of it, and you're getting those minerals in an over-chemicalized world. We got smart moss gold, right? That smart moss gold is like a Viagra for the brain. You ever find yourself where your brain feels like it's low? You tap one of these and your brain gonna feel high level. Yeah, and women love a sapiosexual, so when those brains are popping and those ideas are running, you stay tapped in. You gotta make sure you stay safe out here. There's all sort of viruses and diseases that's running around this world, especially during this time if you're traveling. Make sure you spray this on the orifices throughout your body to kill any of those viruses or any of those things trying to invade you. So make sure y'all tap into goldwater.com so next time somebody asks you, what's keeping you high level? What's keeping you young and healthy and wealthy feeling? And now we can take some of that credit for it over here at goldwater.com. Make sure you keep your health journey running. It's a marathon. Peace. You know, and it's a whole different atmosphere, environment, and biological technology, right? That the average doesn't even have access. Most people don't even feel good throughout the day. And I mean like energy levels. The amount of energy that is required to activate to be optimal, right? Every single day, because you have to think about, you know, any device that is very powerful has to be powered up. Right. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Just like a human being. Mm-hmm. But I don't even think the levels of what human being have on a daily basis are optimal enough to even access gifts that may be lying dormant. As we talk about junk DNA, so called. I believe like, you know, as you talk about like like water, right? Mm-hmm. Energy changes the structure mm-hmm. of water. Right. Once you get crystallized into a certain state, you're in that Christ consciousness. Right. And in that particular consciousness, you're operating above right? Everyone else in reality, you see things they can't see. You can speak in ways they can't see. Even the ability to see angles and perspectives is a superpower, especially with men who have no vision. Everybody doesn't even have a loud inner voice or great imagination. So being able to take that, and we talk about non-local, but being able to take the crystals in your own mind, that pineal activation in your own, and 
activated in someone else's, I believe that that's a real ability. And I do have a question, though. I want to know from your standpoint, do you believe that it was man, men who built the pyramid, or was there extraterrestrial or some other entity that we are unsure of? Or you I, are unsure I think of? it was I think it was both. Mm. I think it was both. I think it was um <clears throat> what we would probably refer to as Atlantean. Mm. Um I believe that it was at least thirteen thousand years ago. We are probably going to soon be able to date the pyramids. What we found in the King's Chamber is that the walls are covered with astrological symbologies. So mm. there's a bull on one wall, right? Bull and cow yeah. on the north wall. Yeah, I there's seen a where lion you discovered that on the back on the west wall. There's a there's a a woman shooting an arrow at an eagle right, while riding a Pegasus horse on the east wall. And then there's a snake, right, going across the center of it. Uh, on the on the, uh, the the south wall, these are astrological positions. You have Taurus, you have Leo, you have Aquarius, and then you also have over here the the, the snake, which also represented by the eagle. Those symbologies are all the symbols of the zodiac. On the Ark of the Covenant, which I actually think originally was the Arcturian Covenant, but on the Ark of the Covenant. There were four faces on the angels, the two angels that are on top, the cherubs, mm. right? The cherub, the cherubim that are on top of the of the Ark of the Covenant had four faces: the face of a man, Aquarius; the face of a bull; the face or an ox, as it's called in Ezekiel; the face of a lion, and a face of an eagle, which is also the snake. Because Scorpio goes through these different transformational stages, the encampment of Israel. So Scorpio goes. Scorpio becomes a snake. After it's a scorpion, then it becomes an eagle, then it becomes a phoenix, and it resurrects. The encampment of Israel for the tabernacle, it was carried around the desert, had the camp of Judah, right? The camp of Manasseh and Ephraim, which were the bull. The camp of Judah was the lion. The camp of Dan was the eagle, right? And the camp of Naphtali was Aquarius. It's matching. Did Moses take the Ark of the Covenant out of the Great Pyramid? By the way, the proportions fit exactly in the sarcophagus, maybe. What I'm saying is that we can now look at, based on where the wall position stuff are, all the constellations, the entire 36 decan are all over the walls of the king's chamber. Mm. And we can look at that and figure out where the four north stars are. You know, we don't only have one north star. We are in Polaris right now. So Polaris is our north star, and it's in, uh, you know, Ursa. It's in Ursa Minor. So we know where to find when a ship is on the sea. That's how it navigates because it knows that we're pointed towards that. Mm -hmm. You go that direction, it's north. So what about throughout time? Well, 6,000 years ago, it wasn't Polaris. It was Thuban was our North Star. And 6,000 years before that, our North Star was Vega, which is in the Lyra constellation. Thuban is in Drakos, which is the dragon. and. Where is it going to be next? Mm. Well, guess what? The next place it's going to be is a place called Deneb. It's, an, it's a star called Deneb, which is part of Cygnus, the swan. All four of these stars, if you look at them in the night sky, they make the proportions of the king's chamber of the Great Pyramid. Their positions are a rectangle that is two times as long as it is wide. Mm. It's matching this, and so does the Orion constellation within it. Are we just in a hero's journey of Orion going through the 24,000-year cycle of the Earth's wobble, mm -hmm. right? And each time having a pull shift and a flood around that as well. That's what I believe. So what we're finding now is that each of these constellations are all over the walls, they're, they're embedded as petroglyphs into the walls. I can show them to you. And this is fascinating because I believe what it's showing us is the true nature of time. The time processes and it precesses at the exact same time. We go from January to February, February to March, March to April, April to May, and that gives us Aquarius, or, or rather Capricorn Aquarius. Aquarius then goes to Pisces, Pisces to Aries, Aries to, to Taurus. Taurus to Gemini, Gemini to, uh, to Cancer, and then Cancer to Leo, in that order. 
And yet, when we go through the 24,000-year cycle, we were just in Pisces, which we know, and now we're going into Aquarius. It's backwards. Precession is the cycle that goes backwards. So while we're going forward each year in the cycle, we're also going backwards. In mathematics, this would be something we refer to as a Klein bottle Mm. or a Mobius strip. Time goes both forward and backwards at the same time, and it's been right in our star constellations all along. We just haven't lived long enough as individuals to see the arc of time. We think about being on Earth. If you go far, far east, what happens? You end up coming back to the same place from the west. You go all around the Earth. You end up the same place you started, right? You go all the way to the north. You end up coming back to the same place, but from the south. Are we simply living in an understanding of linear time that's not actually linear? Because our lifetimes are too short for us to see I the arc of it. I definitely don't believe that. I believe that we live in cycles. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like, it's like seasons. Calendars and clocks aren't real, right? They give you a location when, or an idea of a beginning of something to measure throughout. But in reality, the only true time is nature. Night, nature gives us our cycles. You can know, you know, what time of the year it is based on where nature is. But you right? can take that extension on the zodiac. Well, yeah, you can do it through astronomy as well based on yeah. the different positions. So you just take astronomy, which is the procession of equinox, is exactly that cycle, and the procession is exactly that cycle as well. Which is where man actually got his evolution, because when he was able to time the stars, then he was able to work on agriculture, because then he knew when he can plant and when he couldn't. That's right. So even understanding that, man's real evolution was always his connection with the stars first. That was the math that he was able to figure out. So when you talk about, you know, um, ancient Kemet, right, the land of the black, talking about that fertile soil, right, and their ability to be able to use it now, to know when it's rising, to know when it's falling, to be able to feed the people. It's important for us to be in tune with cycles. Most people know where they are, but they don't know when they are. Right. And to know when you are like there's a book on the ancient role of Arabs in astronomy Mm -hmm. and it talks about the mathematical application of astronomy and how most people you can look at astronomy as stars or planets or you can look at it as math. Mm -hmm. Right. There's a point in where it's at this mathematical position and there's a point when it's at this mathematical position. Right. And each one relay uh, um, uh, uh, a different set of coordinates that let you know what time it is. Mm -hmm right? Where we are in time, right? And the shift of that position and what that means. So nobody has to tell you what something means. You can say, okay, I'm going to do this study for myself. It's like if somebody want to know what time it is on earth and they say, well, it gets hot around this time. So this is where I'm going to say this is, right? The time where you're supposed to grow things. Then it gets cold. Well, this is a time where we hibernate, Mm -hmm. right? We bring everything in. Mm -hmm. So it's the same thing with astronomy, right? All the person has to do is clock the position of the time of what's happening on earth and grade that as this must be its cycle. And then we go through constant replenishing, but we just don't live long enough, of course, to experience multiple cycles unless you're in a phase of the beginning and the end of a cycle or the end and the beginning of a new cycle. Then you're blessed to experience two cycles in a lifetime. Which is what I talked about with the age of revolution. Yeah. So let me ask you a question then. Do you know why we have a perfect eclipse? Why we have a perfect eclipse? Yeah. Mm. We're the only planet in our solar system that has a perfect eclipse with its moon and its sun. Mm. How? How does that happen? The only way that can happen is if the distance between the Earth and its moon is exactly proportionally the same difference as the difference between the, the moon diameter and the sun's diameter. So, in other words, if the moon is a certain distance, right? If we look at the diameter of the moon, the diameter of the moon is 2,160 miles. And that means that because the, the sun is 93 million miles away from us, the mm-hmm. proportion of that 93 million versus the distance of 232,000 miles between Earth and the moon has to be the same dis- distance. So 93.3 million divided by 232,000 miles 
gives you a number. It's going to be roughly 400 times. And the diameter of the sun has to be exactly then 400 times larger than the diameter of the moon. Mm. Mathematically, that's pretty improbable <laughs> yeah. that that would just happen. And by the way, when we look in the sky from our perspective, standing on Earth, we look at the moon. At night, on average, the moon is the same size when it's a full moon as the sun. Yeah, proportionally look the same perspective from us. Yeah, it's like a silver coin or gold coin. But if you ask the scientists, it's this all by coincidence. It's all by coincidence, <laughs> right? I don't believe in coincidence anymore. They don't believe they positive nothing, boy. That's yeah, cold. So, so let me ask you this then. If we were going to make a perfect time system, how would we do it? Mm. If I could make a perfect time system and I had the knowledge, the ultimate knowledge, I would say, okay, let's look at the diameter of the sun. Mm hmm and for the time that the Earth is going around the sun, it should have a unit of measure that's somehow related to the diameter of the sun. So the diameter of the sun is 864,000 miles. How many seconds do we have in one day? So 864,000 miles. We have 24 hours times 60 minutes times 60 seconds. Multiply those together, you have 86,400 seconds in one day. Who created our time system of 86,400 seconds in one day? Oh, the ancient Sumerians. Well, we don't know exactly because they were the oldest civilization that we know about. But maybe they had it before then. Mm. So we're talking about the perfection of for every second is 10 miles of diameter of the sun. For every second of one day is 10 miles of diameter. I mean, that's kind of perfect. Right. Like, seriously, how the hell would somebody have come up with that? Well, it's because consciousness made this so that it would be found. Who is consciousness? It is this concept of, of God, a creator, right? And, you know, it was Louis Pasteur who said, when you study a little science, you go farther away from God. When you study a lot of science, you come nearer to him. Realizing that all these patterns and syntropy are not coincidences is for us to learn so that we can now enter into a new age of thought. A new age of thought that brings us to the realization that the hurt of one man is the hurt of all, and the love of one man is the love of all. And that enlightenment really is when our expression of love as humanity supersedes and exceeds our desire for one objective truth and the ego of being right. Mm. And that's what I hope is going to be changing in this world. And I, for one, am, I'm here for it, right? That's, that's what I'm here for. And I, I just think that humanity has this incredible resilience. And when we have the truth, whatever that truth is, it could be ugly. What we're here to learn is how to fall in love with all of it. We, we need to stop seeking perfection and start seeing it all around us. Mm. That's when the world's going to change. So that's your interest in geometry is the seeking of perfection in God's art. Seeing it, seeing it as it and is, seeing it. seeing it as it is and realizing the beauty and symmetry and all of it. And that it's, it's also me, you know, it's ego. When you believe, you know, a lot of people can see and look at the universe and the majesty of it. And you look, go to Zion national park or whatever, and you see the beauty of that place and you say, wow, there's a God. But what people have a hard time comprehending is that they're part of that same creation. Mm. We think that with all of our mistakes, all the bad aspects of ourselves, all the darkness that we have within us, whatever that is, that it's something that we should shun and be ashamed of or blame other people for. But if you're able to see that the whole universe around you is God, and you think you're the only exception to that, mm. that's ego. That's why we have the ability to do math because then we can understand God. I think that's exactly right. I think God is all around us and it's hidden in this beautiful tapestry of mathematical womb mm. matrix that we can all tap into if we decide that that's what we are wanting to do. Mm -hmm. Not everyone's going to do it. Mm. I mean, yeah, and some people I know, they go down these mathematical rabbit holes and it's like a deep hole. And they're like, yeah, talking numbers and sounding crazy and shit. That's life. <laughs> yeah. But the fact that every time I thought that there might be a coincidence, 
I later realized that it was simply that I had to zoom out farther to get more in greater perspective to see the patterns mm. that were clearly existing all around me. Instead of me looking at it as, okay, I'm losing it, I just realized that that was the signature of the divine all around me. And that's how I look at the number 19. So I'm going to pull up something. I'm going to show you this. Okay. I'm going to let you read it. Yeah, the mark about. So it is all of the synchronicities, synchronicities yeah, so of 19.47 19. degrees. 19. Yeah. 5. Yeah. Yeah, 19. yeah, 4, yeah. 4. I was just, uh, you know, you, the pyramids at Teotihuacan are 19.47. Mm -hmm. It's where the tetrahedron would nest at its, at its vertex, mm -hmm. right, in the planet. And then it goes, it's a whole list of all of them. So the volcanoes, Jupiter's spot, right, Giza, um, you name it. And this is what I want people to understand something. As we have our conversations, right, there's a lot of people who seek it. I think all of it is, for me, is number one is being able to see your father's signature in the world. Yep. Uh, everything, mm -hmm. right? So you can think of God as a painter, right? And all of these beautiful paintings that were left behind. And people are like, well, I don't know who did things before. Right. But right there, somewhere in those, kind of like how Da Vinci has his code in there, you know, it's him because it's coded. Right. God puts his signature in there to let you know this was an intelligent design. And if this is an intelligent design, then you are intelligent design. If the greatness of your maker has the ability to do things beyond understanding. Right. And you're created in that same image. Then what is your ability at the same time? Right. In the Quran. There was, I believe his name was, um, I'm, I don't want to butcher his name, but he discovered a mathematical pattern in the Quran, the number 19, mm -hmm. right? And it says over it are 19. And there is all of these correlations of verses and surahs that add up to the number 19. And it was supposedly put in there to protect it from anybody making any changes. Because if you make a change, then you can tell because it's no longer adding up to the number 19. Now, he ended up being killed because of this, right? He was assassinated. He ended up, um, he knew Mother Tinetta, who had a, um, a relationship with the number 19. She had this ongoing publishing that she did in the Final Call newspaper called Unveiling Number 19. And she documented everything that came to and about the number 19 that she was going about. She also related it to the feminine, right, and the masculine. Right. With the sun, of course, in yeah. the nine mm -hmm. planets in mm -hmm. rotation. And I believe that we are in this phase where. Man has went into the nine one one era. Right. It's like if you look at man and woman, right. Masculine, feminine, that's 19. You're good. You got balance in your world. All is great. But if you don't have that, then you have periods in time where man doesn't regard woman as equal. Right. He puts her behind the boy. Right. So now, you know, there's an imbalance mm -hmm. because that only balance is going to be that one and then nine. Mm -hmm. So America or current civilizations throughout time have been going through an emergency phase. Right. Because that woman also represents the subconscious. Right. She represents that womb, that matrix in which everything goes inside. She has that ability of that inversion. Right. Of her womb to where she take things in. Right. And then she brings forth things into light. But man does not treat his counterpart with that same respect, honor, reverence or balance because he has put himself in the only position that requires reverence or respect. So the way I look at it also with this generation, they have what I call nine minds, especially young men. Right. Their their nine minds is where they're more emotional than logical. Mm -hmm. Right. And so if you look at like, uh, I think it was, was a car, John talking about the pure I tell us, right? Mm -hmm. The Peter Pan syndrome mm -hmm. that goes on in the world where they're stuck in these shells. They can't mm -hmm. think logical or process things the right way because yes, you're supposed to have feelings, but you're supposed to rise above emotions into the thinking of God. It's supposed to be able to go and process up into that crown chakra instead of getting stuck down here where you rot. So now they're more emotional. They're less intuitive. They don't have the ability to guide themselves. So especially as we're going into these new ages, you have them being targeted, 
right? I believe this the 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 word that I want to use, targeted by institutions and corporations, knowing that they're sensitive. Yeah. Right? Knowing that, you know, they don't have the ability to interpret reality. It's not the warrior generation. It's not the gritty. It may be revolutionary, but it's not warrior in that sense. Right? And women can't be safe until it's re-solidified where men think mathematical again, mm-hmm. right? And then she can be in her softness as a womb. But right now we have a reverse where and the men can process your emotions. Too. Yeah. They process the emotions before the logic. But the logic is supposed to filter the emotions. That's when you're 19 minded, right? And I had made this, uh, we did a futurist video maybe about five years ago when I was given a breakdown or the psychology that's going to change the society. Right. And we're like 100 percent there now, unfortunately. But in a sense, we're distracted with the plight and the problem so much that we're not actually thinking about the dream. We're thinking about what we want to get rid of instead of what we want to build. And for me, that becomes an issue because when we're it's it's almost uh, we're taking a step backwards as we try to take a step forward. And then it's like, okay, what about the children that have to live? in the next 10 years or 20 years or 30 years, what will we have for them besides saying that, look, we just fought to get rid of this? That's not enough for me. So for me, it's about will we have economic systems? Will we have technological systems? Will we have AI capability that's geared towards black excellence? Or will we wait for these things to be built and then we'll be continuously fighting the system as they're being built? Or will we be a little more progressive in our order saying, no, let's get into this tech race now. Let's do like what Akon did with the Acoin. Let's build our own economic paradigms. I know we face a lot of issues with mental health services. Let's start setting up nonprofit clinics all throughout the U.S. Let's stop waiting for governmental intervention and let's just start intervening with ourselves. Let's stop complaining about holidays as paganistic and let's just start creating ones that's more cultural for us. That's building solidarity. So the reversal is. You being able to put those traits of a man learning, right? Mm -hmm. As we have in this conversation, this is what I consider a masculine conversation, Mm -hmm. right? We're talking about math, literally. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Knowledge, wisdom, understanding. Mm -hmm. It's the logos. Yes. So when we can change the ideas of what um, one believes as they say, I am a man, it is the becoming of a full mind, a whole mind, right? And psychological Mm -hmm. wholeness is missing in this generation. So once they're able to become psychologically whole, then they can operate with that 19 mind, right? Now you can move about incorrectness, but we are in that still phase of 911, right? Where the womb is unprotected and the logic is behind it, right? And we're not filtering things the right way, which is why it is feelings over fact. And once you're, you know, having a course where people are seeking knowledge, Mm -hmm. right? Um, having, you know, secret initiates and things of that nature. People talk about secret societies, but what are they? Seekers, mm-hmm. right? They they want to know something the public don't know, right? Mm-hmm. They want to be a part of something that's not mainstream. They don't want to be an NPC. Right. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, if you're not a part of a circle, right, then are you living to me, right? Because if we talk about geometry, you'll get into them circles. That, 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 that sacred flower, are you living up to the potential that your father wants you to live up to? Right? You got to be a part of something. You're so right. I, it was reminding me of this song that Billy uh, sang mm. at this uh, event that we were both at. Yeah. When you got this award and I, I did too. And it was, you, uh, you might remember, it was like, Chilling with Thoth in the halls of a menti, no <laughs> food in three days, stomach's empty, right? <laughs> I was laughing my ass off. And then he said that oh, to me. He's like listening to it when we were in uh, Bora Bora for his wedding. Chilling with Thoth in the halls of a menti. That's what I think, you know, people kind of aspire to, to be able to have that. You know, it reminds me of this quote, when the heart thinks and the mind feels, the river of wisdom flows. Mm. I think there's something really profound to that. We often get in this mode when we start to go through this awakening journey. We start to blame all the stuff on ourselves. That's when we know we're halfway there. We're not blaming other people anymore. Right. We're like, oh shit, I did this wrong. I did yeah. this wrong. I did that. But that's also not the, the best place to end at, right? The ending is when you realize 
wait, even my existence was here for a reason. Even all the things that I thought I screwed up, all the stuff that was bad. I'll give you this, this one thing that's really, really interesting that you'll, you'll probably enjoy. I told you that the square root of two is like the essence of two, right? It's the infinite nature of two. I could compress in an infinite amount of data into the number two, into one digit, and then do an operation to square root it and get an infinite number so that any conversation that ever existed in the past and every, every conversation that will ever will exist can be found in those number chains that are non-repeating forever, right? That's the nature of infinity. So if the square root of two is the spirit or the infinite nature of the number two, then the square root of three is the spirit or the infinite nature of the number three. And number three, we associate with the Trinity, the divine aspect, right? This Jed pyramid, the three equal sides, the father, mother, or, you know, Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. And I think the Holy Ghost is another one that we probably did a little bit of a male washing on because we didn't want to say, oh, it was probably like a Holy Mother type mm. of a spirit aspect. Well, when we think about this, we can think that the square root of two is the essence of duality and duality sucks. In this world is suffering. In this world is difficulty. In this world is death and murder and sex trafficking, and all the stuff that we just don't like about this really difficult-to-live-in world. And we can get really bogged down and get really depressed over it, too. But when we start to add it together to the essence of the divine trinity, what is the square root of two plus the square root of three? Would you be surprised to know that it is approximately pi? So when you add the duality aspect to the divine aspect, you get the full circle, completion, holy, holiness. 1.732050 is the square root of 3, and 1.4142 is the square root of 2. You add those together, they equal 3.146. Very, very close to pi. Now, what's interesting about this is if you take this and look at the proportion of the circle, of the 360 degrees of that circle that is pi, and you look to see what proportion of this is related to the square root of two component. Guess how many degrees that represents? Mm. 161.8 degrees. It's the golden ratio. 1.618 is the Fibonacci number, right? Expansion. So, you have two numbers, you add them. So one plus one equals two, two plus one equals three, three plus two equals five. So then you can continue the series of Fibonacci numbers and you have five, eight, 13, 21, 34, 55, um, 89, 144, 233, 377. So this, this expansion and all tree branches compile with this, right? They all end up complying with this exact same mathematical self-generating pattern. Mm. So if you're going to create a computer game, you don't want trees to be able to grow themselves without you having to determine, okay, this year I'm going to put X number of branches on the yeah. tree. You would do it so that it did it automatically. And that's what this math is. So, but if the square root of two represents the essence of duality and suffering and difficulty and pain, isn't it interesting that when we add it to the context of divinity, that it turns from lead into gold? The square root of two is representative also of the symbol that we see when we look at Saturn. The alchemical symbol for Saturn looks like a square root of two. It's like lead. Saturn represents lead in alchemy. And so now with the simple context of understanding what the divine aspect is, math with meaning, starts to take on a whole new life for us. Mm. That's why people are falling in love with math right now. They're falling in love with it because they hated it. If you're capable of hating something, you're capable of also loving it. Yeah, it's like ontological mathematics. It's ontological mathematics because it's now math with meaning and people are starting to learn to communicate. The more synchronicities they see and experience, the more connected to the divine aspect they feel. When you can start to realize that all the shitty things that happened to you in your life happened for a reason, that you chose it all. I don't even remember my teachers in school mm. that were easy. I don't remember their names, but I sure do remember the hard ones. Yeah. Challenge. And the ones who challenged me, that pushed me, my coaches that were like, you're, you're better than this. 
yeah. and beat the living shit out of me, yeah. honestly, because they pressed me and they believed in me more than I believed in myself. Mm. Those are the people I remember. When I went to my Hall of Fame thing in my high That's school, fact. is it not going to be the same with all the difficult experiences that we experience throughout life? You know, how often does it happen that we look back on moments and that we previously said that was the worst thing that ever happened, and then a year or two later we say that turned out to be the best thing that ever happened? Mm. It's all about our perspective. When we can start to actually see the lead of our experience turning to gold because we understand the divinity within it all, that we wanted to learn and our greatest teachers become those experiences that we remember the most, they become most dear and most precious to us. This to me is the reason why we're here. Mm. To learn how to alchemize this experience and transcend it and realize that everything that happens has its equal opposite embedded within it, and it's to perfection, and it was exactly what was supposed to happen for our highest benefit. The universe doesn't happen to us, it happens for us. Mm. That's the hermetic principles. Exactly. The hermetic principles starts off, the first one, the all is mind, mm -hmm. everything is mental. Right? Then you have polarity, you have gender, you have vibration, you have correspondence, you have all of these laws, and if you haven't studied those listeners out rhythm, there, rhythm, cause, and effect. Rhythm, cause, and rhythm, cause, and effect. All these things combine to help you interpolate this experience that we call life. And you know, I'll, I'll end on this: that uh, there's a story that that Ronald Reagan used to tell. Whether you like Ronald Reagan as president or not, I don't care. But the story he used to tell that resonated no, so we'll beautifully. Ronald Reagan. No. Hmm? What's that? We don't mess with Ronald Reagan. You what? I said we don't mess with Ronald Reagan. We don't no. mess with Ronald Reagan. Nah, not Reaganomics. So, not Reaganomics. So, so check this out. So he would tell this story, which was quite funny. Two little boys. Their parents worried about them because they were twin boys, and one boy was super optimistic, the other boy was super pessimistic. Yeah. So the parents didn't know what to do. They went to a psychiatrist. The psychiatrist said, look, let me do a little test on them on Christmas morning. So he sets up a room for the little optimistic boy and he sets up a different room for the little pessimistic boy. And the room for the optimistic boy is actually out in the outhouse. So out in the, you know, they're living on a farm. And so he takes the room for the little pessimistic boy, fills it up with all the best toys at Christmas you could ever want. The G.I. Joe with the eagle eye and the special grip and and all the stuff, the Legos that you any boy could ever want, the erector sets, all of it. He takes the little boy that's pessimistic and he swings open the door. He says, Merry Christmas, all of this is yours. Mm. And the little boy bursts into tears. Mm. He says, why are you crying? He says, because my friends are going to steal some of these toys. You know, I'm going to break some of them. I'm going to be really sad and some of them are going to get lost. So the guy's like, wow, this guy's really a downer, really pessimistic. So he takes the little optimistic boy outside, opens the door to the barnyard area, and all there is is horse manure in there. And he says, Merry Christmas. This horse manure is yours. And the little optimistic boy jumps up and down. He's so happy. And he says, why are you so happy? He says, well, with all this manure, there's got to be a pony in here somewhere. <laughs> What we experience in life is not what it is. What we experience is what we believe happened to us. You could have the exact same experience for two people, three people, four people, five people, ten people. Now we're talking about, oh, yeah, we can make a whole game where people can all experience the same thing and have entirely different results. And we call this spatial computing. Spatial computing. The truth is, it's been this way all along. What you experience is not what you actually experienced per se. It's what you believe you experienced, which then led to a certain emotional response. That emotional response becomes real to you. Mm -hmm. The only things that are real in this world are what we feel. Mm. What determines what we feel is the tether and anchor point of what you just said, which is having the logos to associate with it and being able to step back and see a larger perspective and maybe realize that it's neither the circle nor the rectangle, but a cylinder. Mm. And that requires an expansion of consciousness. Sometimes it also requires us to go through suffering and pain and difficulty. Mm -hmm. But those greatest teachers of our lives are the ones that make all the difference. Mm -hmm. So I got one last question because we didn't do any introductions really for you. Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay. And you By the are, way, I have a book just like that. Oh, yeah. 
It's uh, no, this one right here, the leather. Oh, okay, yeah. I've got except favorite. I've got all the different chakra stones on top of it. Yeah, but it's my like sister that got me one like that. It's for my birthday, actually. Yeah, it's very nice. But I like this one. It's mm -hmm. a little more simple. I got it from Sedona, I believe. Mm -hmm. So, simply put, what do you do now? Before you answer the question, okay. <laughs> I know for a fact, and I want you to, if if you can, you have patents and inventions, mm -hmm. right? Normally, when someone such as yourself that is a successful businessman, mm -hmm. right, um, has wealth, right, has resources, things of that nature, they're not also a thought leader in the field, right, of sacred geometry, mm -hmm. right? Which is, that's why you're interesting. Because you have this duality that goes on, mm -hmm. right? You have an understanding of the material world, right? Um, structures, mm -hmm. infrastructure, creating business, management, right? Managing teams. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, you're fully dived into all of your interests. <laughs> yeah, I am. 100%. <laughs> so can I get a brief bio of your business history and sure. some of your patents mm -hmm. and inventions? Sure. So I spent most of my life in healthcare. Uh, and in photonics and laser technologies, uh, I was formerly president of a company called Coherent Medical, which was a large laser company. Um, I spent most of my life and career outside the United States in the early stages. I spent nine years living overseas, um, working for companies and running large and small and mid-sized companies. And then also I grew up in the UK. So I spent Mm. Before I was 30, when I was 32, half my life had been spent in the United States and half was outside the United States. So I lived in England from seven until 14. And I lived, you know, nine years in different countries after that. I had a very, very diverse background and experience. I got to see the world got to at a very young age. You know, I've been to over 140 countries now. And I've learned nine languages or eight languages in the process. I've mm. actually learned a few others too, but I don't count those. I looked at um, life as an opportunity to learn from anybody and everything. Every experience I could meet. And I would talk to taxi drivers all over the world, and I'd usually do it hopefully in their languages if I could. And I would get to know everything about a country. I learned a system for learning languages. Um, I had a very successful career. I'm a Taurus. I don't know many poor Tauruses. I used to think it was all just my hard work. Yeah. And, and then I realized it might just actually be the stars and the numbers I was born under. We're destined for luxury. We're destined for luxury. <laughs> I love that. Yeah, I hear you, though. No, people, it's true. People used to think I was lazy because I didn't want to walk everywhere. No, I just want to drive. Yeah, exactly. No, I hear, I, I hear that. So it's like there's something that's just different about uh uh, the Taurus mentality. It's, yeah. it's earthy, it's grounded, it's all these things, but it, it's, it's a natural manifester, mm -hmm. natural manifester. So for me, I was also a cross between grounded and spiritually minded. So I could always see the future before it happened. Mm -hmm. Like, and, for, and people thought I was psychic, that I could see the future, yeah. that I could pick trends. It was like, you know, Steve Jobs could give a, he gave a speech in 1999 at, when I was at Harvard Business School. And he gave this speech. We watched the film of it and everything. There were 180 CEOs in the room. And the professor said, what do you guys think about this? Was Steve Jobs lucky or good? So this is like 2010, right? When, when the, the professor asked us this. And he showed this video of Steve Jobs giving the speech. And he's giving a first presentation on an iPod. So there's this tiny little iPod. And it's like, it's MP3 player. And this is a computer company, right? So everyone's like, what are you doing talking to us about? an iPod. This is, this is crazy. And he said, no, 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 you, that's too narrow-minded. You have to look at this as this little device of an iPod is going to replace all of these other devices. Mm. You put a Sony Walkman on. Okay. That's easy. I can, maybe that's a stretch, but we'll see how that does. Okay. Then he put a refrigerator on there. He put all kinds of stuff. He put thermostats and homes on there. He put stereo systems. He put whole gigantic computers. He put cell phones on there. He had like 30 different products and he's like, all of them get wiped out with this one product mm -hmm. as we execute on our strategy. One after another, they all went down. Mm. And I remember the professor asked us, you know, there were still like five people in the classroom that said he was lucky. You know, it was like, no, the guy had the ability to see around the corner. Mm -hmm. Let's be real. Nobody would have ever said that they needed an iPad before the iPad came out. Market research would have told you 
no way do you need an iPad. Yeah. And yet, when the professor asked us in the room, how many of you have iPads? Everyone had an iPad. How many of you have iPhones? I have one iPhone. How many iPads do you have? Started counting it up because it's used in my house all over the place. I had like 36 iPads. Mind bowling, right? It's like, what the, f what? why do I need three? I didn't even realize I had that many, but I started counting it up in my different houses. And I was like, what in the hell do I have that many iPads? Oh, 36 for? iPads. And now if someone said, I'm going to take away your iPad. Yeah, you got 36 iPads, for. I'm going to take away your iPad. I'm going to take away your iPhone. I'd say, hell no. Yeah. You can't take that from me. Well, I we're cyber that. connected to, well, we like Androids. We connected to our phones. Yeah, exactly. We are. We're connected to our phones. That's how we consume information. They are now. external hard drives. Exactly right. And it's for me, it's like a training wheel, just like messaging and texting and everything else. Training wheel for telepathy. That's mm. all it is. So I started, you know, I, I ended up launching some big products. Uh, I became president of Allergan, the big pharma company. Mm. Um, and I, you know, I was president of Allergan Medical and I launched, uh, my teams launched Botox. Mm. So global Botox. So, so, so you're responsible Botox. for all of this. I, I'm responsible for, <laughs> I was a leader for a long time in the aesthetic medicine industry, which by the yeah. way, in philosophy, knowledge of aesthetics is a key aspect of progression mm. along the evolutionary path. And so I launched a, a product uh, called Juvederm, which mm. has become you know, a worldwide product as well. Uh, these are multi-billion dollar products and technologies now. Uh, Latisse, which is an eyelash product. I had Cindy Crawford come up to me at a party once and she was like, hey, you're Robert Grant, aren't you? I'm like, yes. And, and she said, um, you have this new product called Latisse that you're launching. I said, yeah. And she said, what would I have to do to become your celebrity spokeswoman mm. for this? I'm like, wait a minute, you're Cindy Crawford, right? And she's like, and this is the party at, in Cabo. And, and she said, yeah, I'm Cindy Crawford. And, and I said, you actually know my name. Yeah. She's like, yeah, I know who you are. And I said, you actually want something from me. She goes, yeah, I do. I said, I'm sorry, I need a moment to myself. <laughs> <laughs> you know, because I remembered back in college talking with my buddies about Sports Illustrated, all these geeks sitting around talking about how would you ever ask a girl like Cindy Crawford out? And I said, oh, I'm not going to ask them out. They're going to come up and talk to me. Yeah. And the funny part is we were talking about that with three women that were in the Sports Illustrated magazine. One was Kathy Ireland. The other one was Cindy Crawford. And the other one was Elle McPherson. And in the course of the next 20 years, all three reached out to me. Mm. That sounds like a tourist to me. You see what I'm saying? Now, one of them, there's a funny story. I was on Sydney Harbor Bridge driving my car. And, you know, the steering wheel is on the right side rather than the left side. And I'm driving along, and all of a sudden, there's a knock on my window. I was just getting ready to throw my $2 coin into the bucket to go through. It was kind of like Golden Gate Bridge type yeah, thing. Yeah, I remember. And she knocks on the window. I look over, and it's Elle McPherson standing in a bikini with her hair all done up. I mm. put the window down, and she's like, can I borrow $2, please? This is 1997. She's the most famous model in the world. So I ended up, you know, giving her the $2 and I thought this has got to be like candid camera type thing. Mm -hmm. This can't be real. We, I pull into the Park Hyatt Hotel in Sydney. I was giving a speech that night. I was only 27 years old. She pulls up behind me and she invites me to have a drink with her. Right. So I'm like, damn, this is like the most famous model in 1997 mm. that year. He was getting busy. I didn't, I didn't go. <laughs> I couldn't do it. I was like, I have another, I have another appointment that I have to go to. The but appointments. Yeah, you're like, that sounds like a tourist to me. <laughs> so so she asked me to do this. Well, I never talked to her again. 24 years later, mm. she sees me on a podcast uh, with Pete Evans, who's an Australian chef. And, uh, and she reaches out to Pete and said, I would like to have a meeting. Can you introduce me to Robert? And so we ended up having like a three-hour long conversation over Zoom during COVID. And then I did a podcast with her. And, and right before I sent her the email, you know, because she wrote this email, I said, L, we've already met. You know, you might not remember, but I was the one who gave you $2 on the Sydney Harbor Bridge. And she's like, I totally remember that. Because it ended up literally, she had paparazzi behind her. The back of my car yeah. was photographed. It was on the front page of like page six in the Sydney Morning Herald. So 
everything that we think is real is not. Mm. What I've learned through all of this, I went through this medical aesthetics industry. Then I became CEO of Bausch & Lomb, the, the eye care company, which, you know, we had 27,000 employees. And I was in my, you know, early 40s. In my 30s, I was president of Allergan Medical. The whole thing is not real. It was just all part of my journey along my path that was my dharma that I had to find. And then I hit a crisis in 2016. I started my own companies. They become billion dollar valued companies. I had a company that within two years of my founding of it was valued at one point, uh, $1.2 billion post money mm. valuation. And that was kind of a big deal. I had like rock stars on the board that were, you know, I had the governor of New Mexico on my board. I had the chairman of the SEC on my board. I had like big time ballers on the board. And then I hit a crisis when one of the VCs tried to do an end run on me. And I had to raise $55 million in one day or lose it all. And I couldn't raise it from anyone outside the company. It could only be people that were already on the cap table. Mm because the VCs were blocking, right? And somehow I pulled a rabbit out of my ass and threw from one end zone to the other, a Hail Mary pass and caught it myself on the other end zone. And after I experienced that and I saw the amount of betrayal that I ended up experiencing through the whole thing, it caused me to go super deep inward. Mm. I was always good at math, but I had to reconstruct my objective reality. So I reconstructed mathematics from the position of does one plus one really equal two? Mm. And I questioned everything because then I started thinking about it differently. And I said, well, what about one line with a connected vector point uh, to another line implies the third line to make a triangle? So if I have one line, no matter if it's scaling or whatever, what the angle is here, and I just have the third line. So then in this context, one plus one equals a triangle because the third line is always implied once you've connected two of the other lines. So I started realizing there's a language to mathematics and that what we considered geometry was really the syntax of that language. And that the mathematical constants themselves, like pi and Euler and phi and the golden ratio, all this stuff, Avogadro's constant, all these different Catalan constants, et cetera, they were all verbs of that language of math. Mm -hmm. And the language of math is a divine communication. Like with suffix. God. I heard you say they like a uh, uh, ing at the end. That's right. It's like yeah. irrational numbers. You append an irrational value to the end of something, and it's like I'm circling, I'm circling this diameter, mm -hmm. right? So it, it which gives by the way, that's a brilliant breakdown. I, I had, that was the first time I heard it broken down mm -hmm. like that in that way. That it's like a, a suffix at the end where it's like a ing, mm -hmm. right? To where it's an actional number, mm -hmm. yeah, right. That makes me understand it the same way I understand language. Yes. Right. And it's just, it has never been stated like that before I had seen you state it. Mm -hmm. And it made me look at all the numbers completely different because I was then able to pair the math with language, right? And see it the same way I would see language, right? So that, those things like that are, I think, are those moments where you can give keys to a mass amount of people and it unlocks that thing. So now when you see a 3.4, da 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 da. Now they're like, oh, I understand. It's doing it. an action. Yes, it's doing an action. And Euler makes squares. The Euler number makes squares. And mm. then you realize that even the word Euler is named after this mathematician named Leonard Euler. Mm -hmm. But Euler is the word, like oil, is owl mm. in German. It's E U L. That's mm. how you spell owl in German. Well, an owl has the unique characteristic that it can spin its head 271.8 degrees. Mm -hmm. And what a coincidence, because it wasn't even Leonard Euler that discovered the number. It was Isaac Newton or Charles Napier who did. So why'd they name it Euler? Maybe it's a pneumatic, right? A mnemonic where we could actually look at it and we could say, oh, the Euler number is 2.718, which you just multiply that by 100. It's the number of degrees an owl can turn its head on its axis. Mm. What a coincidence. It's kind of like the 86,400 seconds in one day and the 864,000 mile diameter of the sun. It's like a wink from God. Mm -hmm. So when we start to realize this, and then you realize that my dharmic path was to go from being this pharma CEO to now I get to live this crazy Indiana Jones life where I get to explore around the world 
and I teach mathematics and I teach this language of the universe. I wrote, you know, I'm re- writing my seventh and eighth books right now. Uh, I have a book called Philomath, another one called Polymath. I'll mm-hmm. send you both of them. Um, and it's, I'm having the most fun of my life right now. Yeah. I've never been able to have so much fun in my life and feel more fulfilled. I get countless emails and letters from people that are falling in love with the language of math because they feel like they could talk to God now. Well, I'm, I'm, I'm happy that, you know, first of all, you, you, you kind of went fast when you talked about Botox. The Botox thing is interesting because it's a Botox epidemic now. These faces don't look like faces no more. I know. <laughs> you know, it's so funny you say that. <laughs> it's an explosion on the lips and the hips, man. Well, you know what? So here's the funny thing. So and you responsible. So no, my <laughs> team came up with this concept of the elevens. So we we actually said, okay, we need to come up with a way to make this mainstream, right? And so we have to come up with some sort of name to make it bad that you have wrinkles. Mm. So we're like, well, what do we? Okay, what do we want to get rid of? Well, we have an FDA approval to get rid of the wrinkles right here, right around your forehead. And so, like, well, what do we call those wrinkles then? Oh, they look like the number 11. Mm. So we came up with Lose Your 11 campaign, mm. right? And now all these women, and I see that there's this there's this one woman on social media. Skip 11 o'clock. Yeah, and she's like, she's like, oh, I got to get rid of my 11s. And she's saying this. And every time I see this shit, right. I cringe now. Yeah. Because I'm like, oh, man, this is what I made. Are you kidding me? This is, like, so crazy. And, and you know, I launched a company after that. I, I founded now 11 companies. So in 2012, I left Bausch & Lomb. I started my own group of companies. Mm. And we have companies in healthcare. It's, it's part of a group called Crown Holdings. Okay. And uh, I'm in healthcare. I have taken three companies public. I took a company called Evelis Public in 2018, another company. And that company is on NASDAQ right now. Uh, it's got a, a decent market capitalization. and I took another company, Aon Biopharma, public this last summer. Uh, and then Crown Sterling, you know, went public with its token. And I have probably... Crown Sterling went public with a token? Uh-huh. Yeah. So crypto? Yeah, it's a crypto. Mm. And it's on several exchanges. And and then we launched Orion, which is our new social platform that I mm-hmm. told you about. Um, I also have companies in... I have the second largest healthcare lender in the United States now, which is called... Uh, Alfion Credit. We have a million consumers that walk around with our credit cards. Mm. Um, and I founded that company. You know, I've always started companies with the mindset of how do we solve a problem for a customer? Mm-hmm. And let's focus first on making our customers successful and making them happy and solving the need that they have. And if we can make profit doing it, then great. But that's going to be our philosophy. And that's always been all the company's philosophies. I you know, took uh, Evelis public. Evelis now does, you know, it's on the path of doing about $300 million a year or so in sales right now. Um, we, uh, Aon Biopharma went public this last summer on the New York Stock Exchange. It's funny, that one I saw when I founded the company in 2013, I saw the ticker symbol on the New York Stock Exchange in a vision. Mm. And the ticker symbol was AEON and the company was already taken. The name was taken. I couldn't use that. So I had to wait until that company got bought out so I could grab the ticker symbol. And it took many years mm. of that kind of methodical planning to come up with the match to the vision I had for it in 2012. And now it's publicly traded. Um, you know, and I, I go, I was in, when I went to Billy's thing in Miami, I was staying at the Faina Hotel. I met this dentist sitting next to me and she's like, Oh, I have all these like 50 practices or something. She was a Russian American dentist. And I said, well, what kind of uh, patient financing do you offer? And she said, oh, we offer care credit and this new, this other one called Alfion credit. And I'm like, cool. <laughs> you know, we have like yeah. almost 10,000 retail sites now across the country. Um, the business side of my life, I have no shame for now. Mm-hmm. I, you know, Evelis is the number it's, it's on the, clearly on the path to becoming the number two neurotoxin company. I had dinner one night with, um, you said a neurotoxin company. Yeah. Neurotoxin is what Botox is. Okay. Botox is a neurotoxin. So I've basically, you know, we launched Botox when I was at Allergan, but then I started my own company and now I compete with Botox mm. and with the number one, you know, real competitor against Botox right now, which is really exciting to watch that grow. You know, Danica Patrick spoke at the national sales meeting. We had hundreds of reps 
at the national sales meeting and Danica's like, wow, really impressive, you know, that, that you, you know, created this company. The thing is, is that if you think you can, or you think you can't, you'll be right in life. You know, as Billy wrote in his book, woke don't mean mean broke, broke. right? Woke don't mean broke. And I thought that was such a classic one. And he called me up one night. He's like, Hey, could you write a little, you know, endorsement thing for my book? And I'm like, of course, absolutely. And, uh, and, you know, Billy's been a, a true friend uh, to me when I, when I, w- I had COVID and everything. And he's the only person who called me every day, like literally. So, and, you know, I'm involved with him on different projects and stuff. I love him and Elizabeth to death. But the truth is that if you think you can or you think you can't, you'll be right. The only real obstacles that we face in this world are the ones that we persistently believe in. Mm. If you believe that you're a victim, you will be a victim. So let me ask you, because you said that when it comes to your business, right? You mm-hmm. you don't have any qualms with that. What what made I you- did at one point. I felt like because when I almost lost my companies, uh-huh. it was over greed. And it was heartbreaking for me. And and the company that ended up becoming the problem area of that was this company called Evelis. And mm. Evelis had a neurotoxin, and toxin is toxic, right? So I'm like, so the greed was, you know, created by the toxin. That we were selling. I'm like, what are we doing? Mm. This is so superficial to be selling Botox and stuff like this. And I had dinner with uh, Nicole Kidman one night. And I sat at this table with Nicole Kidman and Kate Beckinsale and Halle Berry at the Elle magazine celebrating women of Hollywood. I don't think they do this anymore. Mm. Halle Berry, what year was this? This was 2009. This was Prime Berry. Okay. Oh, this is Prime Berry. Oh, yeah. This was Prime Berry for sure. So I'm sitting here. Tours for sure. I'm sitting next to. Anne Hathaway, at the same table, Isla Fisher, Halle Berry, Kate Beckinsale. I'm the only man at the table Mm. and nine of the hottest women of Hollywood sitting at my table. And this was a junket. I don't think they do this anymore. Uh, Benicio Del Toro was giving some speech that night and they invite all the heavy advertisers for Elle magazine. Mm. So the CEO gets to come. It's not something where you bring your wife to. You get to come and meet. It's like a junket, right? Yeah. This is kind of a thing. So, of course, I get, because I was the biggest advertiser, I get the best seat yeah. in the house, right? With all these, like, super, super famous, you know, actresses. And Nicole Kidman's sitting there, too. And I was thinking the whole time, I'm like, how do I tell her politely she needs to let up on the Botox a little bit? Because <laughs> it's hurting my sales. You know what I'm saying? I say that. <laughs> <laughs> because she she had so much, she looked like a bat. Yeah. And I'm like, bro, how do I say this? You gotta relax. You gotta relax. I'm like, you got who's your doctor? I'm gonna get you a new one type yeah. thing. I know someone who's gonna do a more natural look. You, know, yeah. you want it to be smooth and natural and all that stuff, not like Well, Ur. you know, they're getting it a lot younger and younger, and a lot of men are getting Botox as well. Yeah, I did it once for uh, I was uh I was interviewed by uh, Fox News. Uh-huh by Neil Cavuto. And so, of course, I had to go get it. And the guy's like, the whole story was, men are getting Botox. We have the president of Allergan Medical here on CNBC, you know, to talk about it. And, and of course, you know, that was where it was starting to get to be something. And now it's, it's like people in their 20s. Like, literally, you could prevent wrinkles ever from coming. Right? I mean, it's a, to me, it's a bit extreme. But, you know, the management team has done i have to say they've they've managed the company well and the good thing with neurotoxin it doesn't hurt anybody i prefer the look of the neurotoxin over you know overuse of dermal filler Mm. which can definitely make you look really kind of how large is the industry it's huge yeah it's multi-billion dollars Mm. um and you know it shows up in the public awareness everywhere and everything and i think right now you know so my companies span Healthcare, uh, healthcare IT, fintech, uh, you know, and 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 lending. Uh, we're in pharma. We also have companies in clean energy, uh, and and in cryptography and security. Mm-hmm. So and also implant technology. I have a technology that will like cure, chips. well, like intraocular lenses that will cure blindness for everybody. Okay. So the 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 major leading causes of blindness are glaucoma, age-related macular degeneration, corneal blindness, um, and 
and you know things like um, you know so glaucoma is when you have tunnel vision, you have loss of central vision for age-related macular degeneration, um, and then you have corneal blindness. And literally all three of these are going to be curable within, I'd say, the next fifteen years. So like the, the contact lenses they utilize the uh, micro technology. Yeah. So except ours goes inside the eye. Inside so the it has eye. a camera. So let's say you have corneal blindness. You've seen people that have like their corneas look opaque, entirely opaque. Cataract also is, mm. is one of the. You know, I said you was it. Bruce Wayne. I think you might be Lex Luthor. <laughs> <laughs> Not quite. Maybe the beauty Lex Luthor. So, so basically, we take the, the those those corneal uh, opacifications that show up like that, and mm-hmm. they sort of cloud over the eye. You normally have to get a corneal transplant to fix that, and and many ca- patients are not indicated mm. for being able to get corneal transplant. So our technology is able to have a camera that then can reproject the image right. into your lens so that it bypasses the need mm-hmm. to even have, you know, anything on the uh you know, you don't you're not you don't have to look through the cornea. It's just reprojecting it into so your it's just eye. interpreting like the light data. But it's like a camera that you can see the world and now the back of the eye is healthy. Mm-hmm. So you put it you put the the little LED screen inside the lens of the eye so what the back of the eye is seeing is this unadulterated perfect image Mm, so now as far as cost wise well like who will be able to afford this eventually everybody Mm. because these technologies are not you know they they can be made at very very low cost and Mm -hmm. and it's not like a contact lens where you're gonna have a disposable that you have to throw away uh, because it's hard and it's uncomfortable what is it made of like what type of uh... it's made of silicone Okay. Usually it's made of silicone. And it's a, a little small disc. And it, it's the same thing that's used right now to fix cataract surgery. So if you know anyone that had cataract surgery, 72% of the population uh, over cataracts. 72 years yeah. old gets cataract. And so they get this cloudy lens that gets filled with this peroxide. And Where do you see hard. The, the other application? Because I know most science start off with ethical medical applications for people who have disabilities, things of that nature. But then... Once it's there, we want to use it for all sort of stuff, right? So p- completely healthy individuals with great eyes want to get an Android eye and connect it to AI or Wi-Fi so that they can go around the world and have Intel data being reported back to them in real time. You know, it's crazy. It reminds me of a, uh, an illustration by Leonardo da Vinci, mm. one of them. And if you just Google Leonardo da Vinci optics, you'll find it. And it shows the anatomy of an eye. So mm-hmm. it shows an eyeball. And you can see the lens inside the eye, and then you can see the cornea sort of bulging out, and then you see the anterior and the posterior segments of the eye, and then the optic nerve coming in the back of it. And then the next picture next to that anatomy of the eyeball is a man's head inside a large eyeball yeah. looking through the lens like a headset. Well. Right? So is art simply imitating life? That's well, the question. I, I've I've already posited the theory that the man evolves from other men, meaning that, you know, we take an idea like Da Vinci, then you get the Wright brothers, then you get an Elon, right? It's this evolution of we're building on top of the previous visions and knowledge sets, right? We're not born in a vacuum where we have to figure out everything. We get to accumulate on top of, right? So I always thought that, yes, Da Vinci has evolved so many minds who followed in that footstep. He created the vision. He didn't have the resources to bring them all to life, right? But people who study him mm-hmm. do have the resources. Mm-hmm. So now this is how man truly evolves, right? I take your thought, I learn it, or I was taught that there are scientists who predict the world, but that only happens. Same thing with prophets. If somebody believes in those predictions to actually bring them into fruition, to make sure that they're brought into reality. So it's like, I subscribe to your version of the future. I like that. You know what? I think I'll go study engineering. I'll go study Mm -hmm. uh, math so that I can be part of that journey of evolution, right? Of man's constant growth or whatever. But to that point, I I know we've headed there. We're in the Android robotic world. Oh, there's no doubt. I mean, after I put on these Apple, like Vision Pro things, dude, when you see this, would, it's, would it's you nutty. get the brain chip? I wouldn't get the brain chip. Mm. No. Um, and, and one of the things that the reason why I built the encryption that I did, that's like the world's strongest, 
Well, yes. Yeah, what am I hacking your eyes? So, so, so it's kind of what I'm talking about. Whether you're using it to correct uh, blindness or whatever, you need to protect your individuality. Mm -hmm. In today's world, <laughs> on my app, we're, we're actually going to integrate this one aspect of it because now on, on Orion, you can have unlimited number of people on a group chat mm. and have it all be quantum secure encrypted, mm. which means that it's sort of like it crushes borders. You can also integrate eventually a module that allows you to speak in real time. So you could do a full worldwide transmission in every language simultaneous trans translation. And your mouth will be moving exactly towards the new language that the person's perceiving it in. And it's pretty remarkable. Like your mouth moves. It's not like some kung fu movie. You're talking about like, AI. I'm talking about AI. Yeah, yes. Yeah, and so yeah, you yeah, could yeah, do a live stream to yeah. millions of your followers instantaneously, and everyone could listen to it in their own language, real time. Well, you see where they just banned robocallers because of what happened with Biden, that they had the AI robocallers acting like it was Biden fooling, I guess, some of the voter block. Yeah. No, that, see, this is what's going to happen, guys. <laughs> this is why encryption, and I, the next new big market, data is the world's most valuable asset. I don't think anybody questions that now. We didn't know that a few years ago, but again, I saw that coming before mm -hmm. it was happening. Yeah. And so what I figured out was if the world's most valuable asset is data, then there needs to be a personalized market for encryption and protection of that data. Mm -hmm. And encryption is the way to put a fence around your ownership of data. Right now, you've got all the movie studios and the, the, you know obviously what happened with the Screen Actors Guild. This is a big issue because if you read the terms and conditions, oh, yeah. they could take your image like Zoom owns your image, they could recreate 19 keys mm -hmm. and recreate content for you and then offer it to you for sale. I don't think most people know that every single company that has your data can, like, okay, so whether it's Twitter, they go you know, study the way you DM, study the way you tweet, your whole language syntax, everything about it, and they can train that model to only train on you. The difference between ChatGPT, it trains on the world. But if you train an AI model specifically only on that user, they can only speak like that user. So you won't be able to tell the difference and no one, nobody else be able to tell the difference between it's them speaking and you speaking. That's right. So, you know, just like you, I'm a futurist. So I definitely like to look out and like, we, it might not matter to you now because it's not consequential to your reality. But 20 years from now, 30 years from now, you go wish that you put a stop to some of these things. Right. That's why it's interesting, you know, um, to hear you speak because you are. Do, do you consider yourself to be in a position of power? I'm in a position of influence and I'm a position as a manifester that I could create. I can create from my ideas. I don't mm. spend much time on my ideas that don't have the ability to proliferate. Right. I think the, the, the one thing that you said that is super important is quantum security. Because where things are going, I don't think most, nobody, most people understand no quantum computer whatsoever, right? Is, is, is very severely small group of people who are even concerned about it. Cause you have to be thinking ahead to even care. But, but in this world today though, it's like by the time you realize what it is, oh yeah, that could be too late. But that's the whole quantum race right now with all the governments because they know whoever gets it right first fast and got that super quantum computer. They running everybody else. And how will you even know if they running you, especially if the computer is able to create a simulation so good that you don't know if you're in it or not? <laughs> <laughs> no, that, that is very well said. And it's a fact because right now we already have propaganda. I don't know if you saw Mark Zuckerberg. Mm. Zuckerberg this week was in Washington, oh, D.C. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Getting railed on, right, by the, by the congressional leaders. And what about? Well, because that they were using AI mm -hmm. to ma manipulate minors mm -hmm. to get addicted to the platform, mm -hmm. right? And then they're committing suicide, and they have no, they 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 have no responsibility for it because None. they're protected and they under the law. We're not creating the content they are. That's right. But this is obviously a predatory practice. 100%. And so finally, you know, Zuckerberg has to get up because he was shamed into doing it right on the spot by one of the senators. And he's like, okay, I'm sorry to everybody. And everyone's holding up pictures of their dead kids. I mean, what a horrible scene. If, if, you're, if you're not paying for social media right now, you are the product. Yeah. 
But see, look what they did. Right after that, he did the smartest move his company could ever do, right? And they offered people that damn dividend, 50 cent. Of course, it was able to allow him to be able to get money too. But that news became bigger and they had the biggest stop junk in history for his company. Yeah. So on a simultaneous day where New York City is claiming that it's a mental health crisis, a state of emergency, right? Because of Meta, his stock jumps the highest in stock history. But you know what? <laughs> Again, it's kind of like what's going on right now. I mean, in, in Gaza. When you really look at it, are you telling me where was, why have the adjacent neighboring countries not said anything about it? Mm. Really? Okay, Yemen, fine. Beyond the Yemenis. What about the Saudis? <laughs> Dude, because where was Benjamin Netanyahu the day that it happened? And oh, by the way, let's not forget, Benjamin was actually warned by the country of Egypt, mm. by their intelligence, that this was going to go down mm. days before it went down. And in fact, what did they do? I talked to, I, I used to live in Israel. I was in Israel for almost a year. And I can tell you that the troops were moved from the border and away. So the response time took seven hours to do anything. And no one's asking this question. Benjamin Netanyahu knew exactly what was going on. He was in Saudi Arabia when it happened. Mm. What was he doing in Saudi Arabia? Oh, he was negotiating and working on this deal called the ben David Ben-Gurion Project, which is to have this new Suez Canal that's going to compete with the Suez Canal of Egypt because they make you know billions of dollars a year on this thing. And they're going to build it with Saudi Arabia, and it cuts right through Israel, and it comes out exactly adjacent to Gaza. Mm. Now, it's not easy to get people that have houses on the coast to agree to step out of their house so the government can have this big giant new river come and wipe you out, right? And then flow out into the Mediterranean. I wonder if now there's going to be new plans with the Israeli occupation of Gaza again to just flatten that parking lot in, to in totality and just have it flow right out through Gaza. I think your wonders become a reality, and I think that that's the problem, uh, which everybody knows. It's one of those things where you believe your operation is too big to fail and you're too powerful to care, right? When you can commit atrocities in front of the whole world and not have to apologize, and you can run your playbook to make people perceive it whichever way that you want to, and when you have that cockiness because you've been doing it for so long, right? It doesn't matter what anybody says, except the court of a public opinion is against them because this generation is different and we do have the ability to think for ourselves. And this puts pressures on the nations that are in support, right? To be like, wait a minute, we see this happening. Well, you may not want to do nothing, but guess what? I'm not going to vote for you. Like McDonald's and Starbucks, Right. We seen them have a slump in sales and their stocks start to go down. And it's direct correlated because people say they don't want to support them. Can you imagine what would happen if we had a defund the government campaign? Hmm. We had a close to that during the one percent occupation. But then we got Obama and we became sleep again. You know what I'm saying? It's, it's almost like what would happen if someone said, let's just not pay taxes anymore. Hmm. 100% dissatisfaction brings about 100% change. So as long as there's enough bread and pony shows to keep people occupied during their time, they won't even have enough time to be dissatisfied by reality. No, th this is the same mentality that was around the time of Nero. Let's, let's you know, claim some games. We'll have some games in Rome and we'll give everyone bread and wine and they could sit and mm -hmm. watch the, you know, bread the gladiators fight it out and kill each other, Let right? Let them have cake. We'll give them a circus. Reason. Give them a circus. And that's what's been happening. But even Rome fell. Mm. Right? Rome did fall eventually. Mm -hmm. it, it's, it was a slow and painful death. And then it just morphed into what we, you know, have today as a legacy, you know, that Largely, king, you know, the king, the emperor, Constantine, became the first pope. Was it Peter? Mm. So when we start to think about it from that perspective, you start realizing the quote of this Sololinsky guy, the social agitator that a lot, many don't like, 
You know, our world is not a world of angels, it's a world of angles, a world where men speak of moral principle, you act on power principle, a world where we are always moral and our enemies are always immoral. This is exactly the oldest story of mankind, which is you wake up one morning, you look at your hillside and it doesn't look so green anymore because the sun's been beating on it really hard in the summer. And you look at your neighbor and your neighbor's, you know, kind of in the shade of the other mountain. And so he's got a lot more green pastures. What a coincidence. I had a dream last night. My God appeared to me, told me that this guy over here worships a different God. I need to kill him and consecrate his land Mm. to my God. You think this happened before? This is the human story. A hundred percent. You have to dehumanize the people first. Information is everywhere. You can log into YouTube right now and type in almost any subject. But I'm going to be honest with you. You won't even know if it's human generated or if it's just based on the algorithm that figured out that you wanted to find this subject. It queried your information, created an automated process so they can get your eyeballs to try to sell you a product or get advertisement dollars. Humans need humans. We don't work and operate that well learning from machines. Because it's the connection to the information, it's the connection to the process that allows us to grow our neurons. It's that connection that allows us to be able to tap into that tapestry of thought to where we need to learn and be in environments to where we feel aspirational and we are inspired and it's empathetic. So today it's not about just having access to the information. It's not just about being able to have democratized education everywhere. It's about connection. Are you actually connected to it? When you are in a community, it reinforces that environment of connection. And that's why being a part of high level looks so important. So you are reinforcing an environment with that human connection. I see you, you see me, you feel felt, you want to learn. Information and data, statistics and numbers and automation is fine, especially if you want to create income and utilize the technology for such. The human connection has always been a real source of learning. Don't just go for the information. Go for the community and go for the connection. First of all, I want to thank you for coming on. You know, there's a lot going on in the world, as there always is, but we are at you know, uh, a turning point in reality where all things are happening all at once. You know, as we talked about, um, of course, Israel, of course, what's happening in Sudan and other nations across the planet Earth is terrible at the same time. And nothing is able to get, of course, equal media, right? As we talk about technology, the resources that allow us to even have the technologies, right, are, of course, connected to human suffering. That's always been the case, whether it's Egyptian silk, right, or whether it's Nikes in China. There's always been a consequence of a loss of humanity, right, the more luxuries that we have. But in the search of us wanting to become more, looking into our ancient past, or I like to call our ancient future, Because when we look in the past, we're not looking for prehistoric things. We're looking for futuristic things, right? We're looking for things that are were marvels of civilization that we don't know how to do today, right? It's the curiosity of the past where they had all of this ancient futuristic methodology, skills, minds, right? Um, Abilities, knowledge, schools. That's what keeps us intrigued. And when we think about man in the past, We think about man in the past in a lot of ways being better than us. So what does that say about who we are today and what we built and where we're going? Right. I think math is such a beautiful pursuit because not only it connects man to his own abilities, his intuitive abilities, his calculating abilities, his logic abilities, but it also allows you to appreciate your pops. God, whether you believe in God or not. I'm not here to put that on you, right? That's your own religious beliefs and your consequences of your thought or whatever you want to achieve or believe in life. But I think that it's crazy to deny the fact that everywhere we look, everywhere we look in nature, right? In man's grand design, there's a signature. And that signature is the signature of the math magician, right? It's the link between the science and the magic, right? As a creator myself, as a business person myself, 
I started off early thinking about the magic. What do I want to create? What do I want to generate? What can I power up? And then I had to learn the science. See, I enjoy scientists. I enjoy people of all different fields, especially that go back in the past because they can do the work for you, right? You may have an intuitive idea about your ancestors or history and what's been done, but then there's people that go and actually have the experience. They dig it up. They do the math. They want to figure things out to know what's real. And then when they do that, they're bringing ancient mathematics to modern man. And that's what this conversation is all about. It's about today's math. One of the great mathematicians that gave the culture to math, right? Father Allah, he taught about the 5 percenters, the 85 percenters and the 10 percenters. Get to know it. One of the person that put me on math, Elijah Muhammad. We had to learn actual facts. We had to learn the diameter of the earth and the planets and the sounds. As a young child, to initiate yourself into a higher thinking, because we were taught that if this is your planet, you should know the square footage and mileage of this planet Earth. <laughs> right? But think about where are you putting your children? Right? How are they developing? What do they know? And is it any consequential to build a better world? Because you can't have a hope for the future to be greater if you don't look for the younger generation, right? And deposit something in their mind to be greater, which requires you to be greater to be the teacher. Because if you're waiting on the institutions that built this world, to help your child become a greater builder of another world, then you have lost your mind. And whatever consequences that happen because of that, you have to flow with them because you are in agreement with it by not going against it. Anytime somebody is seeking truth, anytime somebody is working towards enlightenment, anytime somebody is going through personal development, accountability, growth, trying to find their zenith, trying working to design something divine in this world they're contributing to the ripples in time or where human civilization will be what evolutionary line do you want to be a part of what lineage look at our ancestors that came before us don't be so in the egotistical to believe that your point of coordinates or where you are in life and everything is going to revolve around you and moving forward no go connect to something connect to something before you so that your descendants and connect to something behind you, your ancestors. Whether you point the arrow in time or either direction, doesn't matter. But it's the connection that allows things to come full circle. And the world is a war of ideas. And the best math behind those ideas wins the war. Because you can have all the plans in the world, but if you don't actually know how to put it together in the execution of that structure, you will lose. You can't build without math. Get your mind together because the war is a logical one. At the same time, it's spiritual. I appreciate you coming on here. Thank good you brother, so Robert much. Because we just had a great deal. We did. Thank you, <laughs> Absolutely. I'm 19 Keys, and this is high level conversation. Tap in with the dog. Two things. I think start a meditation practice, which is a very powerful thing. Um, and you know, lots of people talk about that, so I won't go into the detail of that, but breath work is a very important aspect of it and start a geometry practice. So what do I mean by geometry practice? Geometry was always meant in the esoteric sense to be a practical thing that you actually draw out the geometry. Why? Because as you draw that geometry, you put yourself in the shoes of the creator and you can empathize with all these different expanded viewpoints and perspectives. You have to force yourself to look at different viewpoints and different angles of perception, which then has the net effect of changing and broadening your overall perspective. As you do that, you can become more empathic. As you become more empathic, then you gain more and more wisdom. This is when the heart is able to think and the mind is able to feel. Intellect should influence, but not control. I think just because the intellects, I, I look at them as having a higher uh, reasoning ability, but the righteousness of being able to point people in the right direction, but not control the direction. Because I was always taught there's no compulsion in Islam and Islam is mathematics, right? And so there's a, a lot of philosophies that I have over my life right now. And one of my favorite ones is always be where there's a will, there's a way. Because it reminds me of young Jabril when I was a child, thinking about all the possibilities of who I will become, right? No matter how hard they were, no matter how impossible they seem, no matter how impoverished we grew up, what traumas or wounds that we have, 
I always knew where there's a will, there's a way, right? So as long as I thought it, then I knew that it was possible. And I've been able to accomplish the things that I've been set out to accomplish in my life because I have an unrelenting ability to think in a limitless way and to always find the way because there is always a way. So where there's a will, there's a way. So what piqued your early interest in math? You know, I had a crisis where I ended up having to question all of objective reality, mm. where I got severely betrayed by a number of people that I thought were friends that didn't end up being friends. That'd do it. And so I kind of turned into a hermit for about two years and reconstructed math and found that it's a language. So I was already a linguist. I speak eight languages. And so I looked at math as a language. And then I discovered a whole lot of new stuff in it because it was, once I realized it was a language, mm -hmm. then there's a way to learn proficiency in language. Mm. And I applied that same approach to mathematics. Actually, I think you got a really good way of breaking down math. You know what I mean? And simplifying it to where it's understandable and digestible. Yeah. And it was just it, it, a lot of the information, um, I think, even for somebody that is, you know, simple in the beginning in the process of understanding can easily digest it. But I think math, math gets a, almost a bad rap in a sense, <laughs> especially by the common man. Right. Because it, it almost feels like it's something you have to be gifted to understand. But. I think the giftedness is in the communication of understanding math. You're so right. Yeah. To me, it's like math without meaning. When mm -hmm. it's taught without meaning, yeah. it's just information. It's well, really yeah, hard no to learn. But math with meaning is divine communication. Mm -hmm. And to me, mathematically, I can prove, I believe this, math does it on its own, doesn't need me to prove it. But I prove to myself that there is a higher intelligence. A higher intelligence. No, nah, look. This right here, crazy. Disclaimer, don't take this if you don't want to have a super day. I think it got way too much of each ingredient in here, especially the lion's mane and the black seed oil and the MCT oil and the cabinoids. This had me up all night and I was just knocking out everything. Got to the point, I ain't even got nothing to do tomorrow. If, if you want to like spread out your week in a week, don't take this. If you want to knock out a week in a day, this right here have you going. This is like Viagra for the brain. You ever wake up and you got limp brain, you feel mentally dry and you don't feel inspired and you ain't got what is required for you to go climb that tower of the day and knock everything down. Don't take this because this had you pound for pound ready to go Mike Tyson rounds. You know what I'm talking about? This super mind right here is the best thing that I've ever had in my life. But I think it may be too much for the average person. Well, maybe we need to put a disclaimer that this is extreme because this right here, man, I can do. I feel like I can do anything literally anything yeah this too much this too much this too much come on what else we got to get done man send me the whole agenda let's do everything today we shooting for 24 hours today i ain't stopping and y'all think i'm playing y'all better take some as well matter of fact here you go yeah you take some because i'm working non-stop ain't no cut let's go